Revelation chapter 18 to 22. Revelation 18. This chapter focuses on the economic system of fallen Babylon. All nations are led astray through the abundance of her delicacies. Verse 3. Therefore, God destroys her. Verse 2. And Israel needs to stop believing the lies of Babylon so that they are not destroyed along with her. Verses 4 to 6. This is difficult to do due to Babylon's sorceries, verse 23. The kings of the earth, verse 9, the merchants, verse 11, and the seamen, verse 17, profited from her. Therefore, they are the ones to lament her fall. By contrast, the heaven rejoices, verse 20, because the system that slew all the righteous people on earth, verse 24, has been destroyed. Babylon represents the best that man can do, yet this is nothing compared to God's kingdom as God destroys Babylon in one day, verse 8, in one hour, verse 10, 17, 19. The result of this destruction is that the earth is lightened with God's glory, verse 1. Revelation 18, 1 When God had Moses build the tabernacle in the wilderness, the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle, Exodus 40, verse 34. God said, The heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that ye build unto me? And where is the place of my rest? Isaiah 66, verse 1. It turns out that the place of God's rest in Israel's program is with believing man on earth, Revelation 21 verse 3, but the glory of the Lord cannot fill the whole earth, as it did in Moses' day in the temple, until Babylon falls. Now that Babylon has fallen, Revelation 18 verse 2, the earth can be lightened with his glory, Revelation 18 verse 1, as the fulfillment of Isaiah 6 verse 3. The fact that the earth was lightened with his glory makes me think that this angel is the Lord Jesus Christ. Even if it is not, the point is that, with Babylon fallen, the glory of the Lord can return to the earth, and especially to Israel, where there will be no need for the light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, Revelation 22 verse 5. Revelation 18 colon 2 as mentioned in Revelation 14 verse 8, is fallen is given twice, once for the fall of Babylon's religion and once for the fall of its economic empire. While chapter 17 focused more on Babylon's religious fall, chapter 18 focuses more on Babylon's economic fall. Isaiah 13 verses 19 to 22 says that, once Babylon falls, it shall never be inhabited. The reason is because, since Satan's kingdom was seated there, it is not fit for man to dwell in. The point of this verse is that Satan's kingdom had to be utterly destroyed before God could dwell on earth. Thus, we saw, in Revelation 12 verses 7 to 9, how the devil was cast out of heavenly places. Now, we see how he is cast out of earthly places. Now, this verse does say that Babylon is become the habitation of devils, Revelation 18 verse 2. However, from Revelation 18 verse 4, we see God's call to the little flock of Israel to come out of her. Since Babylon was burned with fire, Revelation 17 verse 16 and 18 colon 8, as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, Isaiah 13 verse 19, we can conclude that the earth in Babylon has been thoroughly purged of the evil in Babylon. Therefore, Babylon, being the habitation of devils, must refer to spiritual Babylon. The earthly Babylon had to be purged of all evil with fire, because the Lord Jesus Christ will dwell for 1,000 years on that land that was once known as Babylon. The land will become Beulah or married, Isaiah 62 verse 4, and the Lord Jesus Christ cannot marry corrupt land. Therefore, it is spiritual Babylon that holds devils and foul spirits, and this spiritual place will be cast into the lake of fire. Thus, Babylon falls, being purged of wickedness so that Jesus can have his millennial reign from that part of the earth, but it is still a habitation of devils, spiritually speaking, in the lake of fire. Thus, God moves Babylon from being on the earth to being inside the earth where the lake of fire is. If Babylon is going to the lake of fire, you may wonder why every unclean and hateful bird, Revelation 18 verse 2, ends up there as well. 
God created animals for man. Animals do not have eternal souls that go to heaven or hell. Therefore, there is no moral issue with killing and eating them, having them as pets, or using them for other purposes. Apparently, then, God uses unclean and hateful birds for the purpose of tormenting people in the lake of fire, which is just as valid of a purpose for animals as God having wolves and lambs dwelling in peace with each other in his kingdom, Isaiah 11 verse 6, because they are created beings with a finite life and no soul. Revelation 18 colon 3 The kings of the earth are powers ordained of God, Romans 13 verse 1. Thus, when they take up Babylon's religion, they commit fornication against God. The merchants of the earth abide by her religion so that they can benefit from her economy. Regular people abide by both her religion, by bowing down to the image, and her economy, by taking the mark, so that they are not killed by the Antichrist. Putting this all together, then, all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, Revelation 18 verse 3. In other words, all nations have rebelled against God by participating in Satan's kingdom through the Antichrist and Babylon. This really shows the completion of God's nationalism program under the curse of sin. When the whole earth rebelled against God with the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11, God separated the people into nations. Now, Satan has united the nations in their rebellion against God, once again, with Babel. Therefore, Babylon needs to be destroyed, and it is time for God to reconcile the nations back to himself through the nation of Israel in the millennial reign. Revelation 18, 4 John 10, 3-4 says that Jesus' sheep hear his voice and follow him. Thus, it is the Lord Jesus Christ, as the Good Shepherd, who speaks here, from heaven. Only those Jews, with faith in God's covenant with Israel, will hear his voice and come out of Babylon, as a result. The tribulation period begins with apostate Israel making a seven-year covenant with the Antichrist, Daniel 9 verse 27, and the Good Shepherd calls to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, Matthew 10 verse 6, during the whole, seven years for them to come out of her, Revelation 18 verse 4. For those who do not, they will receive of the plagues given to Babylon, which include being thrown into the lake of fire. We see the same command from God to come out of Babylon in Jeremiah 51 verse 9. God even tells us to do the same with unbelievers today in the dispensation of grace, 2 Corinthians 6 verse 17. Revelation 18, 5-6 Revelation 17, 4 says that Babylon's false religion resulted in her having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Meanwhile, God has a cup of his own to give her, which is the wine of the wrath of God, Revelation 14, verse 10. The order from heaven is for Babylon to receive double the wrath, according to her works, Revelation 18, verse 6. In other words, she is to receive double the punishment that will come upon the Jews for following this false religious system. This is the fulfillment of Matthew 23 verse 15, which says that proselytes made by the Pharisees are twofold more the child of hell than they are. In other words, apostate Israel, joined to Babylon, receives double the punishment in hell than the Jewish leaders of Jesus' day, because they rejected the Christ and followed the Antichrist, while the Pharisees of Jesus' day just rejected the Christ. Also, note that Babylon hath filled fill her cup, Revelation 18 verse 6. This means that her iniquity has reached its fullest. In other words, she is wicked to the point of no return. Therefore, she cannot be saved, which is why judgment is coming upon her now. Revelation 18, 7 Babylon claimed to glorify God, but she really only glorified herself. Similarly, Churchianity today claims to glorify God and even quotes scripture, but is only glorifying herself. 2 Timothy 3 verse 5 calls this having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. Such is the case with Babylon in the tribulation period, as well. The result of Babylon's glorification of herself is that she lives deliciously, meaning that she follows the lusts of this world. 
Therefore, she is deserving of much torment and sorrow, Revelation 18 verse 7. Note how similar the Babylonian religious system is to Satan. Satan says, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne, and I will be like the Most High, Isaiah 14 verses 13 to 14. Babylon says, I sit a queen, Revelation 18 verse 7. Thus, she is the queen of heaven, Jeremiah 44 verse 17. The king, Satan, and the queen, Babylon, will ultimately spend eternity in the lake of fire. Babylon was married to the people of the world in Genesis 11 and will be married to them again in the Great Tribulation. However, the people of the world die in eternal judgment in the lake of fire due to their unbelief in God. This is how Babylon is a widow. She will see sorrow because her adherents will perish. Isaiah gives further detail about her attitude of not being a widow. She says, I am, and none else beside me. I shall not sit as a widow, neither shall I know the loss of children. I am, and none else beside me. Isaiah 47 verses 8 and 10. This is important to note. Because, just two chapters before this statement in Isaiah, God says, I am the Lord, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none else, Isaiah 45 verses 18 and 22. Therefore, Babylon's statement that I am, and none else beside me is her statement that she is God, not unlike Satan's statement in Isaiah 14 regarding himself becoming God. Therefore, when Babylon says, I sit a queen, and am no widow, and shall see no sorrow, she is really saying that she is God. This is why she must be destroyed. Ultimately, this is what New Age religion says today when it says that you cannot judge them. They can do what they want to do. Revelation 18 colon 8 the one day, here, is at the end of the tribulation period. She experiences death while all of her adherents being gathered in Armageddon to battle the Lord, only to be destroyed. Babylon experiences mourning over all those leaving her. Then, she experiences famine in that she has no adherence after God judges them all. Babylon is Satan's religion and he will appear to be God during the Great Tribulation. However, the Lord God is the strong one. Therefore, Satan will be powerless in trying to keep his queen Babylon's empire from crumbling. As stated previously, she must be burned with fire to purge the land of her sins so that it will be a holy place for the Lord Jesus Christ to dwell with his bride, Israel. Revelation 18, 9-11 The people of the earth are selfish. They do not really care if Babylon falls, for Babylon's sake. They mourn because their riches are taken away because they got rich and powerful by aligning with her. Babylon's fall takes away the power of the kings of the earth, which makes them mourn, Revelation 18 verse 9. Babylon's fall takes away the economic prosperity of the merchants of the earth, which makes them mourn, Revelation 18 verse 11. Note how the kings of the earth stand afar off from Babylon because they are afraid of being punished as well. Nevertheless, their pride causes them to gather to fight against God, even though the destruction of Babylon should have made it clear to them that God is more powerful than they are, even if they did contribute to the destruction of Babylon themselves, Revelation 17 verse 16. Revelation 18, 12-13 Each of these verses lists 14 items that the merchants of the earth sold in Babylon. This is 7 times 2. Thus, we see the number 7 in Revelation again. Note that the last item of merchandise listed is the souls of men, Revelation 18 verse 13. This is not slave labor, because the item before it is slaves. Rather, what this means is that the Antichrist will put a bounty out there on people who do not worship the image of the beast. How do you think Hananiah, Miss Hale, and Azariah were brought before Nebuchadnezzar and thrown into the fiery furnace for not bowing down to the image, Daniel 3 verses 8 to 13? A person will receive a certain amount of money for each person turned in. Therefore, there will be bounty hunters, making a living out of turning members of the little flock over to the Antichrist. This is the merchandise of the souls of men. By the way, 
Jesus Christ is our kinsman redeemer. The Antichrist will probably proclaim that he is redeeming believers rather than buying them in order to destroy their souls by getting them to worship the image. In other words, the Antichrist will say that it is out of his great love for the world that he is willing to pay to bring them to God by having them take the mark. After all, these are poor, misguided souls who God wants to redeem for his own. This is the lie that the Antichrist will probably tell. Of course, the truth is that the Antichrist is really destroying men's souls by getting them to align with Satan. Revelation 18:14 The fruits of the merchandise are what are produced spiritually from the merchandise of Revelation 18:12-13. Of course, all of the spiritual fruit from Satan's kingdom is bad. The fruit would be the works of the flesh that we see in Galatians 5 verses 19 to 21. Jesus said, "Ye shall know them by their fruits." Matthew 7 verse 16. Therefore, Although apostate Israel will appear to be godly, by speaking of God, doing miracles, and quoting scripture, their fruits will give them away as being aligned with Satan, because their fruits will be the works of the flesh. Jesus said that every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire, Matthew 7 verse 19. That is what has happened, here, with Babylon, its rulers, and its merchandise. They are destroyed. Revelation 18, 15 Just like the kings of the earth stood afar off when Babylon was destroyed, Revelation 18, verses 9 to 10, the merchants do the same, Revelation 18, verse 15. The reason is because God will judge the men of Babylon separately from the city of Babylon. Armageddon is when God gathers the men of the Antichrist's kingdom away from Babylon, Revelation 16, verse 16. He then destroys the city of Babylon chapter 17 to 18, while the men watch from Armageddon. They weep because everything they worked for in this world has been destroyed. That is why Jesus said, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, Matthew 6 verses 19 to 20. Next, the men of Babylon will be destroyed in chapter 19. They know that they will be destroyed, too, because, when Jesus appears, they will say to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Revelation 6 verses 16 to 17 Therefore, part of their weeping is due to the fact that they know that their destruction is coming next. Revelation 18, 16 Note that Babylon bears the number of a man by being clothed with six things, fine linen, purple, scarlet, gold, precious stones, and pearls. It even mimics the holy city, since Jerusalem has streets of gold, gates of pearl, and precious stones. Jerusalem also has the righteous clothed in fine linen. Thus, Satan made Babylon to look like God's holy city, Jerusalem, as part of his deception. Revelation 18, 17 Now we see the merchants outside of the Babylonian area, crying over Babylon's destruction. The kings of the earth feared her torment, 1810, as did the close merchants, Revelation 18, verse 15. There is no mention of the faraway merchants fearing Babylon's torment, probably because they were not closely tied to her religious blasphemies. However, they do stand afar off, just like the others, which shows just how frightening Babylon's destruction is. Revelation 18, 18-19, by reason of her costliness, Revelation 18, verse 19, tells you that the merchants and business owners will get rich off of Babylon's economic system. The middle class, if there is one, will struggle to make ends meet, as all of the profits go to the businesses aligned with the Antichrist's empire. This is seen in the fact that the only group, other than the little flock, that does not mourn over the fall of Babylon, is the common folks, since they are not mentioned. The shipmasters, though, do mourn because they were made rich, Revelation 18 verse 19, by Babylon. Note also how the ship merchants only care about the material world, as they exclaim, What city is like unto this great city? Revelation 18 verse 18
In Revelation 21 verses 10 to 27, we will get a description of a far greater city, the New Jerusalem. But the merchants chose not to place their faith in God and be inhabitants of that city, because doing so means suffering through the tribulation period. Therefore, they choose to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, rather than esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Babylon, Hebrews 11 verses 25 to 26. Revelation 18 colon 20 Now, the scene shifts to saved Israel in heaven, who is waiting for God's overthrow of wickedness upon the earth so that they can rule and reign with Christ on earth. Since Babylon has been overthrown and the wicked people will soon be slain, saved Israel in heaven starts rejoicing. Although all of saved Israel rejoices, there is a greater rejoicing among the apostles and prophets of Israel's program because they were subjected to greater persecution and death by the Babylonian religious system. In Revelation 6 verse 10, martyred members of the little flock ask the Lord, How long? Dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? By the time we get to Revelation 18 verse 20, God hath avenged you on her. Therefore, they rejoice, because their prayer has been answered. Note the great contrast in God's two realms, heaven rejoices, and the earth mourns over the destruction of Babylon, Revelation 18 verses 9 to 20. We also saw the heavens rejoice in Revelation 12 verse 12 at the midpoint of the tribulation period when Satan was cast to the earth. That rejoicing was due to the body of Christ being able to take Satan's positions in heavenly places. Revelation 18 colon 21 Babylon's fall fulfills the prophecy of Jeremiah 51 verses 63 to 64. The important part of 1821 is the phrase, and shall be found no more at all, Revelation 18 verse 21. Babylon rose up against God in Genesis 11. It continued in mystery form after that. It will then rise up in its full power in the great tribulation period, and shall be found no more at all, tells us that, at the end of the great tribulation period, God will utterly destroy Babylon, never to rise again. Praise the Lord! We should also note that Jesus said that it were better for a millstone to be hung around someone's neck and that person be drowned in the sea than to offend little ones, keeping them from entering into the kingdom of heaven, Matthew 18 verses 4 to 6. This shows that Jesus did not choose this illustration by accident, since the mighty angel, in Revelation 18 verse 21, also takes up a millstone and casts it into the sea to describe the great violence with which Babylon is destroyed. Revelation 18 22-23 following after a false religion is considered by God to be fornication. The way that Satan gets people to follow religion is described here by God as by sorceries, Revelation 18 verse 23. In other words, Satan uses cunning craftiness, Ephesians 4 verse 14, having transformed himself into an angel of light, 2 Corinthians 11 verse 14, to get people to follow their own lusts of the flesh, while making them think that they are following the word of God. In other words, Satan casts a spell upon people by turning God's word into a sorcery book to get men to follow him and think that they are following God. Bar Jesus is a type of this, being a sorcerer, who desired to hear the word of God so that he might turn people away from the faith, Acts 13 verses 6 to 8. That is exactly what Satan does. He recognizes the power of God's word, Hebrews 4 verse 12, and uses that power for his own, selfish purposes. Paul asks the question, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you, that ye should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you? Galatians 3 verse 1 If they were bewitched, then a spell was cast on them from a spiritual sorcerer. In the tribulation period, Satan's ministers will cast spells upon apostate Israel by transforming themselves into the ministers of righteousness and the apostles of Christ, when they are really false apostles, deceitful workers, 2 Corinthians 11 verses 13 and 15. Thus, by thy sorceries were all nations deceived, Revelation 18 verse 23. 
Five groups of people are mentioned in Revelation 18 verses 22 to 23, 1, entertainers, musicians, 2, skilled and unskilled workers, craftsmen and the sound of a millstone, 3, educators slash scholars slash philosophers, light of a candle, 4, young people in love, bridegroom and bride, and 5, businessmen, merchants. Primarily, these are the five ways that the people of this world are made happy. They enjoy entertainment, working at a job, studying for education's sake, pursuing love, and making money. This shows that those who pursue these things for their flesh's sake are under the spell of Babylon, thinking they are doing good when they are really just following their own lusts. These worldly pursuits are not found anymore because the things of this world pass away with the destruction of the world system, 1 Corinthians 7 verse 31. Today, everyone on earth, including churchianity, seems to be pursuing happiness. The United States Constitution even gives everyone the opportunity for the pursuit of happiness. This shows how entire nations can be cast under the spell of Babylon, as seen here. Revelation 18:24. In talking to the Jewish religious leaders of his time, Jesus said, Upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth. All these things shall come upon this generation, Matthew 23 verses 35 to 36, referring to the generation of vipers, Matthew 23 verse 33. Now, in Revelation 18 verse 24, we are told that the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth is found in Babylon. This shows that the religion of apostate Israel in Jesus' day was the Babylonian religion, which is the religion of Satan. Therefore, we can also say that, today, the greatest enemy of Christians is the Christian religion, because man thinks that it is of God, when it is really of Satan. Babylon hath caused the slain of Israel to fall. Jeremiah 51 verse 49 By her false religion, therefore, God destroys her at the end of the tribulation period. Revelation 19 With the city of Babylon destroyed, God now focuses on destroying all those aligned with the Antichrist. First, we see saved Israel in heaven, praising God for destroying Babylon, Revelation 18 verse 20, 19 colon 1 6. They are then given their wedding garments so that they can be married to Christ, verses 7 to 9. However, Christ has to come to the earth and clean off a place for him and his wife to dwell together forever. He has all of Satan's followers gather together for the battle of Armageddon, verse 19, 16 colon 12 16. The Lord Jesus Christ then comes on a white horse, verse 11 to 13, and completely destroys Satan's armies, verses 20 21. Note that there are no casualties on God's side. God totally annihilates Satan's armies. Jesus destroys them with the word of God, verse 15. It is such a destruction that all the birds are called to feast on the flesh of the wicked, verses 17 to 18, and they actually become full of the feast, verse 21. The beast and the false prophet are thrown into the lake of fire to burn forever, verse 20, while all men aligned with them are killed, verse 21, and will be judged into that same lake of fire after the millennial reign is over, Revelation 20 verses 11 to 15. Revelation 19 colon 1 after these things tells us that God's judgment of the people who follow the Antichrist takes place after Babylon falls. In the sixth vile judgment, God allowed the unholy trinity, Satan, Antichrist, and false prophet to perform miracles to get as many unbelievers as possible to follow them to the battle of Armageddon, Revelation 16 verses 12 to 16. This may seem like a cruel thing, but it was actually a show of God's mercy. The reason for this is because, in chapters Revelation 17 to 18, Babylon was destroyed. By getting the Antichrist's followers to come out of the city before its destruction, it enabled the people to see all of this take place. There should be no doubt now, in the minds of the remaining members of the lost sheep of the house of Israel who have not believed the gospel yet, that they need to come out of her, my people, Revelation 18 verse 4. 
Perhaps the fall of Babylon coincides with the midnight cry of the believing remnant to the virgins who are still sleeping, resulting in their salvation, Matthew 25 verses 5 to 10. As mentioned in the notes on Revelation 6 verses 12 to 14, the Lord's coming for this final battle will be after a period of darkness for, possibly, 45 days, 1,335 days in Daniel 12 verse 12 minus 1,290 days in Daniel 12 verse 11. After the whole world gathers for this battle, God turns off all the lights, the sun is black, the moon is blood, the stars fall, and the heaven is taken away, Revelation 6 verses 12 to 14. Therefore, the lost sheep of Israel have 45 days to sit in darkness to contemplate what the fall of Babylon means before they decide to actually go into battle with Satan or not. This gives them plenty of time to believe the gospel and be saved. Revelation 19 verses 1 to 6 ends up being the fulfillment of the command in Revelation 18 verse 20 to rejoice over her, thou heaven. In Revelation 19 verse 1, we see the people in heaven praising God, because man's kingdom has been destroyed, and God will soon set up his eternal kingdom on earth, Daniel 2 verse 44. The four characteristics of this are, 1, salvation, 2, glory, 3, honor, and 4, power. Salvation has come because God has saved his people from their sins and from the adversary, Matthew 1 verse 21, Jeremiah 31 verse 11. Glory comes to God for the great victory he won over Satan. Honor comes to him as the Gentiles come to him during the millennial reign to worship him as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, Isaiah 66 colon 23, 2 colon 2 dash 3, and Revelation 19 verse 16. Power is unto him, as he keeps sin at bay during the millennial reign, by ruling the Gentiles with a rod of iron, Revelation 19 verse 15. Revelation 19 colon 2 Babylon caused the world to rebel against God, their creator, and serve Satan instead. Then, members of the believing remnant were killed by Babylon's followers. God's punishment always fits the crime. Since the crime was leading people into the lake of fire and killing the little flock of Israel, Babylon's punishment is for Babylonians to be killed, Revelation 19 verse 21, and be thrown into the lake of fire themselves, Revelation 20 verses 11 to 15. This makes their punishment true, Revelation 19 verse 2, i.e., their punishment fits their crime, and righteous, Revelation 19 verse 2, i.e., it is a fair punishment. This punishment also makes God faithful to his promise to avenge the blood of his people. Revelation 19,3 Mark 9,43-48 says that the fire of hell is never quenched. In Revelation 14 verses 9 to 11, we were told that those aligning themselves with Babylon by worshiping the image and taking the mark will burn forever in the lake of fire and that the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. Therefore, when we see Babylon's smoke rising up forever and ever, Revelation 19 verse 3, we can conclude that the city of Babylon also burns for all eternity in the lake of fire. This shows that God judges both Satan's religion and the people that follow it in the same manner. Revelation 19 colon 4 and Revelation 4 verses 10 to 11, we saw the 24 elders before God's throne say, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. That was at the beginning of the tribulation period. Now that the tribulation period has ended, we see the 24 elders again, just after we are told, salvation, and glory, and honor, and power, unto the Lord our God, Revelation 19 verse 1. This means that additional glory and honor comes to God through the salvation of Israel, and it takes the events of the tribulation period to bring Israel to a place where they have the faith to allow God to save them. With Israel having been saved, the four beasts and the twenty-four elders declare Alleluia, meaning glory to God or praise to God. Note how prevalent the praise of God is with the destruction of Satan's kingdom, as we hear Alleluia in verses 1, 3, 4, and 6. Revelation 19, 5 The voice, coming out of the throne, is probably Jesus, the man, leading Israel in praising God. 
Alternatively, it could be David doing this since David will be co-regent with Jesus in the earthly kingdom. See Ezekiel 37 verses 24 to 25. In any event, this praise comes after Babylon is destroyed, but before Jesus' second coming. Therefore, saved Israel has not yet received the atonement. That is why they are still called God's servants, here, while today, in the body of Christ, we are his sons, Galatians 4 verses 5 to 7. Once Jesus comes back, Israel receives the atonement, and they become God's sons at that time, Revelation 21 verse 7. Ye that fear him, Revelation 19 verse 5 would be Gentiles in Israel's program who get to enter God's eternal kingdom because they blessed Israel, Genesis 12 verses 1 to 3 and Matthew 25 verses 31 to 46. God says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, Proverbs 9 verse 10. These Gentiles will be on the earth to be ruled by the Lord Jesus Christ for 1,000 years, as believing Israel goes to them as a kingdom of priests to reconcile them back to God, Exodus 19 verses 5 to 6, Zechariah 8 verse 23. Then, those Gentiles, who trust in God to give them righteousness, rather than trusting their own self-righteousness, will side with the Lord Jesus Christ in God's final battle with Satan, Revelation 20 verses 7 to 10. The result will be that these Gentiles will be eternally saved in God's earthly kingdom. These Gentiles, then, are encouraged to praise the Lord for giving them the second chance to enter God's kingdom in Israel's program. His servants, Israel, and ye that fear him, Gentiles, Revelation 19 verse 5, together comprise all those saved during the prophecy dispensation. Revelation 19, 6 Since the multitude covers all saved people throughout history, except for the mystery dispensation, this is a great multitude of people. Note that they call the Lord God omnipotent or all-powerful. No one can say that I made it into God's kingdom by my good works, or I made it by keeping the law. All men are powerless to save themselves. It is the omnipotence of God that takes man from being Satan's lawful captive, Isaiah 49 verses 24 to 25, and brings him into God's eternal kingdom. Since the Lord Jesus Christ is the blessed and only potentate, 1 Timothy 6 verse 15, no one can stop him from doing this. Also, note how loud the saved are. They are the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thunderings, Revelation 19 verse 6. This shows that they are a large group, and they are an excited group. All saved people are excited to give praise to the Lord for all eternity for giving them eternal life in His kingdom on earth. The Trinity is also seen here. The great multitude of people would be those who are in Christ. The many waters represent the Holy Spirit, John 7 verses 38 to 39. The mighty thunderings represent God the Father's voice, John 12 verses 28 to 29. Thus, God's eternal power and Godhead, Romans 1 verse 20, are both seen here. Revelation 19 7 Isaiah 62 1 4 says that Jesus marries the land of Israel. When we see the bride in Revelation 21 verses 9 to 27, it is a city, the new Jerusalem. Romans 11 verse 26 says, All Israel shall be saved. Thus, the marriage of the Lamb is when the Lord Jesus Christ marries all Jews, who, by faith, are part of saved Israel. In other words, believers make up the city, just like the body of Christ today is said to be the building that groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, Ephesians 2 verse 21. The Lord Jesus Christ has been waiting a long time until his wife hath made herself ready, Revelation 19 verse 7. Israel is not ready to marry Christ until she has faith in God. She does not have faith in God until she has been tried by the fires of the tribulation period. God puts Israel through the refiner's fire of the tribulation period. The result is a pure bride who has faith in God so that they are pleasant unto the Lord, Malachi 3 verses 2 to 4. 
They have repented from following the Babylonian religious system, the Antichrist, and apostate Israel, and have faith that God will deliver them from Satan via the law covenant he made with them. It is, then, by this faith that his wife hath made herself ready, such that she can now marry the Lamb, Revelation 19 verse 7. Christ is seen as the Lamb because he is the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world, John 1 verse 29, and so his bride sees him as the Lamb, see Revelation 5 verse 6. Revelation 19 colon 8 because Israel is holy by faith in God to save her from being Satan's lawful captive, Isaiah 49 verses 24 to 25, she receives the righteousness of God imputed unto her, as evidenced by the fine, clean, white linen she receives here. In Isaiah 1 verse 18, God said, Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. They were scarlet when they followed the scarlet-colored beast, Revelation 17 verse 3. Now, by faith, they are white, and so they receive the white linen, which is the righteousness of saints, Revelation 19 verse 8. In Revelation 3 verses 4 to 5, believers in Sardis are said to walk with Jesus in white, for they are worthy. The reason they are worthy is because they overcame. They overcame by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. Revelation 12 verse 11. This is why Revelation 19 verse 8 says that to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen. She did not earn salvation by her works. Rather, she had faith to overcome Satan by the blood of the Lamb, and so God grants that she receives his imputed righteousness. Revelation 19 colon 9 the he of this verse is a member of saved Israel, as seen in Revelation 19 verse 10. So, who are called? The answer is in Revelation 22 verse 17, whosoever will may come. This would be the whosoever will of Israel specifically, as Matthew 22 verse 14 says many are called. The many represent Israel. Of course, the Gentiles may be saved in Israel's dispensation as well, but they are not part of the bride unless they become proselytes. The problem is that, although many are called, few are chosen, Matthew 22 verse 14. The reason that few are chosen is because many Jews try to come to God with their works rather than by faith. Therefore, they come to the marriage supper without a wedding garment on, Matthew 22 verse 12. In other words, they are not wearing the fine linen, which is the righteousness of the saints. Therefore, they are unholy and must be cast into outer darkness, Matthew 22 verse 13. Outer darkness is a place outside of God's kingdom where they will wait until the great white throne judgment when they are cast into the lake of fire, Matthew 13 verse 42, Revelation 20 verses 11 to 15. That is when there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, Matthew 22 verse 13. Now, getting back to Revelation 19 verse 9, those called to the marriage supper of the Lamb are blessed because they have the opportunity to be married to the Lord Jesus Christ forever. Just like a woman is blessed when she finds and marries a godly man, all Jews, with faith in God, are blessed because they get to be married to the perfect man, the Lord Jesus Christ, for all eternity. Note that Revelation 19 verse 9 ends with these are the true sayings of God. This tells us that Satan will so blaspheme God and his word that he will convince Jews that the marriage supper is a bad thing. After all, Jews expect their Messiah to overthrow the government and begin world rule immediately. That is what the Antichrist will do. Jesus did not do that. Instead, he came and suffered and died first. Therefore, Jesus will be depicted in the tribulation period as the false Christ. Therefore, marrying him would be a bad thing in that view. This upside-down view that will be prevalent during the tribulation period is why many are called, but few are chosen, Matthew 22 verse 14. Revelation 19 colon 10 since the one standing before John is a member of saved Israel, he is not God and should not be worshipped. Now, John knows to worship only the true God, 1 John 5 verses 20 to 21. However, John seems to see God everywhere he turns, whether it is Jesus the man, Jesus the lamb, 
Jesus the angel, etc. Therefore, John may think that this angel is Jesus the man, but he is not. He is just a plain, ordinary man. Therefore, he should not be worshipped. We know that he is a member of saved Israel because he says, I am of thy brethren, Revelation 19 verse 10. The phrase the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, Revelation 19 verse 10, is very illuminating. Old Testament prophecy is focused on getting Israel to have faith in God's law covenant with them, such that they turn from their religion and idolatry to serve Jehovah God so that he may give them eternal life in his kingdom on earth. That is the goal of prophecy, the spirit of prophecy, though may not be clear from the Old Testament prophets, which is why it is great that this illuminated, saved member of Israel reveals that the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. The letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. 2 Corinthians 3 verse 6 The letter of the law covenant cannot bring Israel into the kingdom as God had promised. It takes Jesus' perfect life and sacrifice for sins in order to bring Israel into the kingdom. Therefore, while the letter of prophecy focuses on the faith that Israel needs for God to give them his kingdom, Luke 12 verse 32, the spirit behind all of this, or the ability to give eternal life to Israel, is in the testimony of Jesus. Therefore, even under the law covenant, it is Jesus' fulfillment of the law, as a man, rather than Israel's obedience of the law, that gives them eternal life in God's kingdom on earth. The testimony of Jesus is that he found God to be faithful to his promises to him. God promised to sit him at his right hand, Psalm 110 verse 1. Jesus endured the cross, having faith that God would give him this promise, Hebrews 12 verse 2. Since Jesus is the firstborn from the dead, Colossians 1 verse 18, he has received the new body after his resurrection and has sat down at the Father's right hand. At the time of the writing of the book of Revelation, Jesus is still the only one who has ever received the new body, and so he can testify that God is true to his promises to Israel when no one else has this testimony. The book of Revelation starts with the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to shew unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass, Revelation 1 verse 1. Revelation is the last prophetic book of Israel's program. God gave similar revelations to Daniel, but God told him to shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end, Daniel 12 verse 4. Perhaps the reason that God does not reveal many end-time prophecies until after the cross is because he wanted to make sure that the spirit of prophecy, i.e., the testimony of Jesus, was known to Israel so that they would have the letter of end-time events until they had the spirit, as well. We should also note how smart saved man becomes, once he begins eternity with God. Before the Holy Ghost came in Acts 2, I dare say that no one understood that Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Not even the twelve apostles knew this, since they did not even believe that Jesus would die for their sins, Matthew 16, 21, 23. In heaven, however, this truth is now clear to saved Israel. This shows that, regardless of how much of God's word we allow the Holy Ghost to teach us on this earth, the majority of our learning will occur in heavenly places throughout all eternity. Revelation 19, 11 This verse refers to the second coming of Christ. At the beginning of the tribulation period, Satan copies Jesus' second coming by riding in on a white horse, Revelation 6 verse 2, but the real coming of Jesus is at the end of the tribulation period, here in Revelation 19 verse 11. Heaven opened. Revelation 19 verse 11 means that the glass sea beneath God's throne in heaven is opened, Revelation 4 verse 6, so that Jesus enters into the heavens surrounding the earth to judge the wicked. Jesus is faithful because he does and has done everything that the Father tells him to do. Thus, he has total faith in God the Father. He is true as opposed to the lies of Satan. Satan is the father of the lie, John 8 verse 44, while God cannot lie, Titus 1 verse 2. Therefore, his being faithful speaks of Jesus' perfect humanity and his being true speaks of his deity. Therefore, 
The one coming to judge the Antichrist and his forces is the Godman, the Lord Jesus Christ. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, 1 Timothy 2 verse 5. His judgments are in righteousness, meaning that he will pardon the saved while destroying the wicked. This goes back to Abraham's question in Genesis 18 verse 25, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? The answer is absolutely yes. The right thing to do in Genesis 18 was to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah for their wickedness. The right thing to do in Revelation 19 is to destroy all those individuals mixed up with Babylon for their wickedness. Sodom and Gomorrah are actually set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire, Jude 7. Therefore, he will make war, Revelation 19 verse 11, with Satan's forces because the people of Babylon are guilty. The first thing Jesus does at his second coming is to destroy the wicked because the earth must be cleansed from the curse of sin before he can give saved Israel eternal life in the kingdom. Revelation 19 12-13 In Revelation 1 verse 14, we saw Jesus' eyes were as a flame of fire. He used that fire to refine Israel so that they would have the faith to enter the kingdom, Malachi 3 verses 2-4. Now, at his second coming, he will use those same, fiery eyes to consume his enemies. God is of purer eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look on iniquity, Habakkuk 1 verse 13, and sin is. Consumed by God's fire, Hebrews 12 verse 29. Therefore, in order to maintain his holiness, Jesus' eyes must be as a flame of fire. The beast was over ten kingdoms, Revelation 17 verse 3. But, because Jesus is King of Kings, Revelation 17 verse 14, he has many crowns, Revelation 19 verse 12, because he is over all kings. The beast was full of names of blasphemy, Revelation 17 verse 3. The Lord Jesus Christ has one name written, Revelation 19 verse 12. So holy is his name that no man knew it, Revelation 19 verse 12, so that they will not be able even to attempt to blaspheme it. The name that man will call him is the word of God, Revelation 19 verse 13. John 1 verse 1 says, In the beginning was the word. Now, we see the word is the end, too. He has come to the earth to make an end of sins, Daniel 9 verse 24. Since the word begins and ends everything, this makes him the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, Revelation 21 verse 6. Psalm 138 verse 2 says, For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Therefore, the name, the word of God, Revelation 19 verse 13, is the Lord Jesus Christ's highest name and is why that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven, and things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father, Philippians 2 verses 10 to 11. All of humanity, regardless of dispensation, is in two men. If you do not have faith in what God has told you, you are in Adam. If you do have faith in what God has told you, you are in Christ, Romans 5 verses 12 to 21 and 1 Corinthians 15 verse 22. God said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you, Exodus 12 verse 23, meaning that the blood of the lamb keeps people from suffering death. Here, in Revelation 19 verse 13, we see that Christ's vesture is dipped in blood. This is the pure, spotless blood of the lamb. The Lord Jesus Christ offered his blood for atonement in heaven. He then put the blood on his vesture. For all those in Christ, we are covered by his blood, such that God passes over us when he brings death upon the world and we receive eternal live. Those in Adam are not covered by the blood because their lives not hid with Christ in God, Colossians 3 verse 3. Therefore, they suffer eternal damnation in the lake of fire. An alternative view regarding the blood is found in Isaiah 63 verses 1 to 4, which says that the blood is the blood of the wicked, who he has destroyed. This would coincide with all of the blood seen in the winepress of the wrath of God at Jesus' second coming, Revelation 14 verse 20. While this is true, 
I do not think this is the primary blood seen in Revelation 19 verse 13 because the vesture here is dipped in blood as opposed to being sprinkled upon his garments as in Isaiah 63 verse 3. In other words, I think Revelation 19 verse 13 is showing Jesus with his vesture already dipped in blood so that believing Israel will be spared his judgment. Jesus will then slay the wicked at Armageddon, Revelation 19 verse 21, resulting in the blood sprinkled on his garment, as detailed in Isaiah 63 verses 1 to 4. Revelation 19 colon 14 thus, Jesus' first order of business in his second coming in Israel's program is to judge the wicked, not to bring salvation to the righteous. Two men shall be in the field, the one shall be taken, and the other left. Luke 17 verse 36. Churchianity says that they are taken to heaven, but the Lord Jesus Christ says they are taken to where the eagles are gathered, Luke 17 verse 37, in order to feast on the carcasses of the wicked that the Lord kills at this time, Matthew 24 verse 28. This is why Revelation 19 verse 14 says that Jesus brings his armies with him to come to the earth and destroy the wicked. The righteous are not destroyed with the wicked, Genesis 18 verse 23, because the righteous are covered by the blood of the Lamb. The armies in heaven are clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Revelation 19 verse 14. Revelation 19 verse 8 says that the Lamb's wife is arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. Thus, the armies, coming with the Lord, are the saved of Israel. When Jesus comes to the house of Israel, the strong man, Matthew 12 verse 29, I, Satan, is in the house and has Israel as his lawful captive, Isaiah 49 verses 24 to 25. Therefore, Christ comes into this house and kicks Satan and his host out of the earth, so that Jesus can dwell in Jerusalem with his wife forever. Revelation 19 colon 15 Hebrews 4 12 says, The word of God is, sharper than any two-edged sword. Ephesians 6 verse 17 says that the sword of the Spirit is the word of God. Therefore, we can conclude that the sharp sword in Revelation 19 verse 15 is the word of God. It comes out of the Lord Jesus Christ's mouth, which shows that the way he smites the nations is by speaking God's word, showing them where they have failed in keeping God's commandments. In Genesis 1, God spoke everything into existence, Genesis 1 colon 3, 6, 9, 11, 14, 20, 24, 26, and now God speaks to destroy those aligned with Satan against him. Jesus ruling them with a rod of iron, 1915, refers to the millennial reign, Revelation 2 verse 27, as seen in Psalm 2 verses 7 to 9. This rod of iron is God's law, as given to Israel in Exodus, Deuteronomy, according to Isaiah 2 verses 2 to 3. Thus, Jesus comes against the Gentiles with the word of God. He smites them with it if they have aligned themselves with Satan at the battle of Armageddon. The remaining Gentiles enter the millennial kingdom where Jesus Christ will rule them by the law found in his word. The wicked are killed at Jesus' second coming. This is the treading of the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Revelation 19 verse 15. The details of this are given in Revelation 14 verses 14 to 20. There, we see the angels go to work in reaping the harvest of the earth's fruit. This means that they take away the wicked to be killed. In Matthew 13 verse 30, this is called separating the wheat from the tares and taking the tares to be burned, and then taking the earth's grapes and thrusting them into the winepress of God's wrath. A comparison of Genesis 1 to 3 and Judges 9 verses 7 to 15 reveals that the fruit on the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was a grape. Eating a grape, then, stands for sin. This is why Revelation 19 verse 15 refers to this judgment time as treading the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Revelation 14 verse 20 says that the winepress was trodden without, outside, the city. From Revelation 16 verses 12 to 16, we see the people of the earth are gathered to Armageddon, which is outside Jerusalem, via the sixth vile judgment. Therefore, Armageddon is probably the location of God's wine press.
Revelation 19, 16 How appropriate that Jesus' bloodied vesture says, King of kings and Lord of lords, since he had to win the battle over Satan, both on the cross and here, in order to earn that title. Note from Revelation 19 verses 14 to 16 that, while saved Israel, Christ's wife, is at the battle, Christ does all the fighting for her. However, the blood of the wicked, from Revelation 14 verse 20, will get on believing Israel's feet, which is why Jesus told his twelve apostles, He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit, John 13 verse 10. In other words, saved Israel is clean, having been washed in the blood of the Lamb and having been water baptized. However, their feet will have wicked blood on them, such that they will need to have their feet washed by Jesus before they actually take their positions of authority in God's kingdom on earth. Revelation 19:17-18 Since many in the world go to the battle of Armageddon, there are an innumerable amount of dead bodies on the ground that need to be cleaned up. Therefore, God summons all the birds to come and clean up for him. Wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together, Matthew 24 verse 28, dot. It is estimated that there are over one billion birds in the world today. Now, you know why there are so many. Note that God is no respecter of persons. The mighty, the weak, the free, the bond, the small, and the great are all subject to God's wrath. God judges men for their lack of faith, not for their lack of money, power, or anything else. Note, from Revelation 19 verse 17, that the angel stands I and the sun. Perhaps this just means that the angel stands in the sun's rays. However, Malachi 4 verse 2 calls the Lord, the son of righteousness. Therefore, it could mean that the angel stands in the Lord when he commands the birds to come to the great God's supper. If so, does this mean that the Lord guides birds where to go? Maybe this explains how birds can fly thousands of miles back and forth each year to the exact location as previous years and never get lost. They are guided by the Lord, the Son of Righteousness. Revelation 19, 19 What a sight this must be to see many in the world gather to battle against God with one billion birds circling overhead, so that they can clean up the carnage that is left behind. Perhaps this is the absolute last chance for unbelievers to change their minds about battling against God. However, all who have taken the mark or worshipped the beast are hardened to the point of no return. Therefore, they will never believe God, regardless of the evidence that is put before their eyes. Revelation 19, 20-21 What is striking is what these verses do not say. Hundreds of millions, if not billions, of people are gathered to fight against God and has saved millions. God's army is vastly outnumbered in terms of people. Yet, the account of the battle is not, they fought, back and forth for years. There were many casualties on both sides. Finally, Satan made a tactical error and God squeaked out a victory. You have none of that here. The war seems to last only seconds. The Lord Jesus Christ, all by himself, destroys all of the people who are on Satan's side. So many people are killed that over one billion birds become completely full off of the carnage. Note the language, and the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet, and the remnant were slain, Revelation 19, 2021. This language shows that the battle was absolutely no contest. The Lord Jesus Christ destroyed them all with the sword, which is the word of God. I doubt any of Satan's people even had time to draw their weapons before they were utterly destroyed. This shows how powerful God's word really is, which is why we are told to use it in our spiritual warfare today. See Ephesians 6 verses 11 to 18. The people of Satan's army will be thrown into the lake of fire, along with all other unsaved people, after the millennial reign is over, Revelation 20 verses 11 to 15. Therefore, they are killed and their souls are brought to hell, awaiting that judgment. The beast and the false prophet, however, are part of Satan's unholy trinity, being Antichrist and Anti-Holy Ghost, respectively. Therefore, they are immediately judged and thrown into the lake of fire to burn for all eternity. Revelation 20
with the beast, the false prophet, and their armies taken out of the way, Revelation 19 verses 19 to 21, God throws Satan into a bottomless pit, verses 1 to 3. With all of Satan's forces, including Satan himself, being taken off of the earth, the Lord Jesus Christ now establishes God's kingdom on earth. For the first 1,000 years, saved Israel rules the earth with Christ as a kingdom of priests to the Gentiles, verses 4 to 6. Once the millennial reign is over, Satan is loose so that the Gentiles can use their free will to decide if they will believe God or Satan, verse 7. Although Satan is only loosed for a little season, verse 3, he manages to convince an innumerable amount of Gentiles, verse 8, to rebel against Christ's rule and oppose God for the final battle, verses 7 to 9. It is not much of a battle, since God destroys them with fire that comes down from heaven, verses 9 to 10. Then, God resurrects all unsaved men and judges them according to their works, resulting in them being cast into the lake of fire, verses 11 to 15. This is an eternal fire of torment that is in stark contrast to the glories of God's kingdom that the saved will experience. Revelation 20 1 3 We saw that the beast and the false prophet were thrown into the lake of fire at the end of the tribulation period, Revelation 19 verse 20. However, Satan is not judged yet, because God must be just in giving the Gentiles an opportunity to make a free will decision to side with God or with Satan. Therefore, Satan is bound and cast into the bottomless pit for 1,000 years. During the next 1,000 years, the Lord Jesus Christ will rule the Gentiles with a rod of iron, Revelation 19 verse 15. Then, Satan will be loosed so that he can deceive the nations for a final battle against God once the millennial reign is over, Revelation 20 verses 7 to 10. Note that Satan is bound by a great chain. People do not take this literally, because they say that Satan is a cherub, which is a spirit, and so he cannot be bound by a chain. But that is not true. If God can create spirits, then he can create a different type of chain than what we have on earth that can bind a cherub for 1,000 years. In Jude 6, the angels that sinned in Noah's day are reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. This tells us that spiritual chains are actually stronger than physical chains since physical chains do not last forever. In case there is any doubt as to who is bound for 1,000 years, for of his names are given, he is the dragon, who orchestrated the angelic rebellion in heaven, Revelation 12 verses 3 to 9. He is that old serpent, who tempted Eve to disobey God, Genesis 3. He is the devil, who walks about as a roaring lion on the earth, seeking whom he may devour, 1 Peter 5 verse 8. He is Satan, who deceives the world into following him, instead of God, Revelation 20 verse 7. Thus, we see that Satan takes on different forms to get the world into his kingdom, just like we have seen in Revelation that the Lord Jesus Christ takes on different forms in order to save those with faith in God. Today, as members of the body of Christ, we are sealed with the Holy Ghost, Ephesians 1 verses 13 to 14, which ensures that we will receive our new bodies. Well, God seals Satan, too, except Satan's seal is to keep him from deceiving the world during Jesus' millennial reign by getting out of the bottomless pit. Thus, Satan is chained and sealed in prison for 1,000 years. We are not told how long the little season lasts in which Satan is loose to deceive the nations after the millennial reign is over. It is probably just long enough for the world to understand what Satan offers so that they can make a free will decision regarding who will be their master. My guess is that the little season will only be for a few months. Revelation 20 colon 4 Now, we see Jesus' millennial reign. We see, here, that the method of killing by the Antichrist of those who will not worship the image of the beast is beheading. In Revelation 6 colon 9, these souls were seen under the altar in heaven. Now, with the victory won over the Antichrist and his forces, they are given thrones to sit on in God's eternal kingdom. Matthew 24 verse 13 says that he that shall endure unto the end of the tribulation period shall be saved. 
Now, we see what enduring unto the end means. It means they had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. Revelation 20 verse 4. Note that believing Israel is not saved by keeping the law, as many people think. They can only lose their salvation by pledging their allegiance to Satan through the mark or bowing down to the image. For by the works of the law shall an oath flesh be justified. Galatians 2 verse 16. These verses, in Revelation 20, give further revelation about God's eternal kingdom on earth. Granted, Old Testament prophecy does say that Israel will be in God's eternal kingdom on earth, but there is no mention in the Bible, except for here, that there is an initial 1,000-year reign, followed by Satan's rebellion. In other words, God did not reveal these two events until here in Revelation 20. Note also that the reason the Antichrist beheaded souls was for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, Revelation 20 verse 4. Jesus said, Whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven, Matthew 10 verse 33. Members of the little flock, who appear before the Antichrist, will be asked to deny Christ. If they do not deny him, they will be beheaded. Thus, they are beheaded for the witness of Jesus. Of course, the reason they believe this witness is because it is based on faith in the word of God, which is the second reason why they are beheaded. We should also note that the believing remnant of Israel's reign on earth with Jesus does not stop after the 1,000 years are over, because Revelation 22 verse 5 says that they shall reign forever and ever. Therefore, the 1,000 years are mentioned, not to limit Israel's reign, but to limit the time they have to reach the Gentiles before Satan is loosed and goes about to deceive them. Revelation 20 5 The first resurrection is not a reference to the rapture of the body of Christ. The rapture occurs before Israel's program is resumed, which is before the tribulation period starts. The first resurrection is a reference to the first resurrection in Israel's program. This is a resurrection of the Israel of God, Galatians 6 verse 16, for them to rule and reign over the Gentiles during the millennial reign. Initially, you may think this resurrection involves only those who were believers during the tribulation period. However, the only other resurrection mentioned in Revelation is of all unbelievers, Revelation 20 verse 13. Therefore, the first resurrection must include all saved Jews in Israel's program going all the way back to Abraham, while the rest of the dead refers to all unsaved people from all dispensations. They stay in the grave until death and hell give them up after the millennial reign. They are then judged to the lake of fire at the great white throne judgment, Revelation 20 verses 11 to 15. Gentiles, who were not destroyed at Armageddon, go into the kingdom to be ruled with a rod of iron by Jesus. They are judged at the end of the millennial reign into either God's kingdom or hell, based upon either blessing or cursing Israel, respectively, see Matthew 25 verses 31 to 46. Revelation 20 6 Another proof that the first resurrection includes all saved people in Israel's dispensation is the statement, here, that they are blessed because the second death has no power over them. Obviously, since only saved Israel is part of the first resurrection, while apostate Israel remains in their graves, those, who are a part of this first resurrection, are blessed and holy, Revelation 20 verse 6. They are blessed by ruling with Christ for all eternity, and they are holy because they have been justified by faith plus works, James 2 verse 24, in order to be washed in the blood of the Lamb. The second death, Revelation 20 verse 6, comes upon those who are part of the great white throne judgment. The term second death is defined in Revelation 20 verse 14 as being cast into the lake of fire. Thus, the Israel of God does not receive the second death. Back in Exodus 19 verses 5 to 6, God told Israel that they would be a kingdom of priests to the Gentiles. God specifically said in that passage that these are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel, proving, once again, that the book of Revelation is written to Israel and not to us today. 
Here, in Revelation 20 verse 6, we finally see them fulfilling this calling in the millennial reign. Isaiah 61 verse 6 mentions this as well. A priest's job is to be a mediator between God and man. Since Jesus is ruling with the rod of iron of the law, Revelation 19 verse 15, saved Israel as a kingdom of priests, will go out to the Gentiles and teach all nations, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, Matthew 28 verses 19 to 20. The Gentiles then respond, as seen in Zechariah 8 verse 23, Ten men shall take hold out of all languages of the nations, even shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, We will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. As they go to Jerusalem, they say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths, for out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, Isaiah 2 verse 3. Thus, we see how God uses, saved Israel as a kingdom of priests during the millennial reign to reach the Gentiles with God's law. In addition to being priests, Israel shall also reign with Christ for 1,000 years. Deuteronomy 32 verse 8 says that the Gentiles will be divided into 12 territories. Each territory will have one of the 12 tribes of Israel over it. Then, Matthew 19 verse 28 says that the twelve apostles will sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Therefore, in addition to getting the law out to the Gentiles, we also see a governmental structure where Israel reigns with Christ over the Gentiles. Now, Daniel 7 verse 18 says that Israel will possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. It is not just for 1,000 years. The reason that Revelation 20 verse 6 says 1,000 years is because of the Satan-led rebellion that comes after that. However, that rebellion will be quickly overthrown. Then, God's kingdom will continue forever and ever. Revelation 20 colon 7-8 You may wonder why God would allow another satanic rebellion. After all, why not completely destroy Satan and his forces at the Battle of Armageddon at the end of the Tribulation period? The reason that God allows another satanic rebellion is that the only way to please God is by faith, Hebrews 11 verse 6. The millennial reign includes Gentiles who just feared God and obeyed his law for 1,000 years because they did not want to be killed. Thus, they obeyed out of fear and not out of faith. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Proverbs 9 verse 10 Which is why God starts with the fear of the Lord via the law. The purpose of the law for the Gentiles in the millennial reign is for them to learn that they are sinners and must have faith in God in order to receive justification, Galatians 3 verse 24, so that they can live in God's eternal kingdom. Therefore, God lets Satan loose from his prison in order to give these people the opportunity to either have faith in God or believe Satan's lies. They must make a choice. Satan, being the great deceiver, does a great job amassing an army so vast that the number of whom is as the sand of the sea, Revelation 20 verse 8. God promised Abram that he would make his seed as numerous as the sand which is upon the seashore, Genesis 22 verse 17. Several thousand years have passed since God made that promise to Abram, and it still has not come to pass. It probably will not come to pass for Israel until the dispensation of the fullness of times. Meanwhile, Satan is able to amass an army that sighs in only a little season. This shows how great of a draw the lusts of the flesh are to man, and this probably gives Satan confidence that he will defeat God. However, because God is the only potentate, 1 Timothy 6 verse 15, God's power alone will easily overcome the power of Satan and his army, regardless of how large that army is. Gog and Magog are names of the people who come up against God. These are not tribes of Israel. Rather, they are people who are in rebellion of God's governmental structure on earth. Magog was a son of Japheth, who was Noah's son, 1 Chronicles 1 verses 4 to 5. Gog was of the tribe of Reuben, 1 Chronicles 5 verses 3 to 4. No detail is given about their lives. 
Therefore, we cannot determine why all unbelievers at the time are named after them. Ezekiel 38 to 39 gives more detail of this final battle. Ezekiel 38 verse 16 says that Gog and Magog will be so vast that they will cover the land as a cloud. They will come against Israel. God says in Ezekiel 38 verse 16 that the purpose of this battle is that the heathen may know me. In other words, the Gentiles are out of the rod of iron rule of God from the millennial reign, and they now have a choice to know God by faith, as the God of all, and take his side and be in his kingdom for all eternity. Alternatively, they can follow the lusts of the flesh and side with Satan and spend eternity in the lake of fire. As we see in Revelation 20 verse 8, the flesh is so strong that most people side with Satan in his rebellion. Of course, many also side with God, and they do so by faith, not by fear, because they have Satan as an alternative to God and they have chosen God instead. Thus, these Gentiles please God, Hebrews 11 verse 6, and are rewarded with dwelling with God in his eternal kingdom on earth. Revelation 20 9-10 Before the millennial reign began, the beast, Antichrist, and the false prophet, Anti-Holy Ghost, led an army against the true Christ, and the true Christ destroyed them in an instant, Revelation 19 verses 19-21. Now, after the millennial reign is over, Satan, Anti-God, leads an army against the true God again, and the true God destroys them in an instant, too. This shows us that God fights Satan on his level. In Revelation 12 verse 7, there is a fight in heavenly places between God and Satan. Since Satan is a cherub in heaven, Ezekiel 28 verse 14, God has the angels, led by Archangel Michael to fight against Satan and his angels. In Revelation 19, the Antichrist fights, and so the true Christ fights him. Now, in Revelation 20, the anti-God fights, and so the true God fights him. Thus, God fights Satan on his level each time and defeats him every time. This time, in Revelation 20, God destroys Satan's army with fire that comes down from heaven to devour them, Revelation 20 verse 9, just like God did with Sodom and Gomorrah, Genesis 19 verses 24 to 25. This is the final defeat of the devil, therefore, he is now cast into the lake of fire. All members of the unholy trinity are now in the lake of fire, where they will be tormented without a break for all eternity. Note that even the devil himself is tormented day and night forever and ever. This shows that the devil is not having fun. In hell tormenting people, as some believe, but the devil is tormented himself for all eternity without a break. To get an idea of what a massive destruction this is, you need to read the detailed account in Ezekiel 38 to 39. There, we are told that it will take seven years for Israelites to burn all of the weapons that Satan's forces used against God in the war, Ezekiel 39 verses 9 to 10. We are also told that all of the house of Israel will work on cleansing the land of the dead bodies, and that it will take them seven months to bury all of the dead bodies, Ezekiel 39 verses 11 to 13. Even after the seven months are over, there will be bones, here and there, that travelers to the land will find that will need to be buried, also, Ezekiel 39 verses 14 to 15. Thus, the satanic army that is destroyed is massive compared with saved Israel. Remember, saved Israel will not become as numerous as the sand of the sea until the dispensation of the fullness of times. Therefore, they are vastly outnumbered by Satan's army in this final battle between God and Satan. It must be a comical sight for billions of people to come with weapons in hand to battle God. They never get a chance to use their weapons, since God devours them with fire. A good comparison would be like an ant coming to you to fight you with a weapon of its own devising, and you simply step on it when it shows up. That is how lopsided this final battle is, yet man is so prideful that he honestly thinks he can defeat God with his crummy weapons. Note that this final battle is against the saints and the beloved city, Revelation 20 verse 9. This is Israel's program. Israel has ruled and reigned with Christ as priests for 1,000 years, Revelation 20 verse 6. 
The Gentiles have had ample opportunity to see that the Lord is God over all and worthy of worship. Gentiles who believe the gospel of the kingdom are part of this camp of saints in Jerusalem and all of Satan's forces come against Jerusalem to try to overthrow it, since that is the place from which the Lord Jesus Christ has been ruling over the universe for the last 1,000 years. Since God has overthrown Satan's rebellion for the last time, eternity now begins. With God's purpose fulfilled with man, time is no longer, Revelation 10 verse 6. Thus, the dispensation of the fullness of times begins, in which all things in heaven and in earth are reconciled together and one in Christ, Ephesians 1 verse 10. Also, the camp of the saints, and the beloved city, Revelation 20 verse 9, represent the holy place since it is where God dwells. Thus, just like those approaching the holy place in the temple without being cleansed were killed under the old covenant, so, too, Satan and his army are destroyed by fire in order to protect the holy place of God's throne. Revelation 20 verses 11 to 2 Peter 3 10 says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Revelation 21 verse 10 mentions the heaven and the earth fleeing away in the past tense, meaning that, once the devil is cast into the lake of fire, the heaven and the earth vanish, since he no longer has the ability to corrupt those realms. Isaiah 51 verse 6 says that the heavens shall vanish away like smoke, and the earth shall wax old like a garment. This happens because both realms, heaven and earth, are polluted with sin. Sin must be completely removed so that none of the effects of sin are felt in God's kingdom. Therefore, just like mankind dies, due to the curse of sin, so does the heaven and the earth. God's universe is now in a position, not unlike it was in Genesis 1 verse 2, when the earth was without form, and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Before bringing in the new heaven and the new earth, God must banish all sin from his universe. This is accomplished with two judgments. The first judgment is the judgment of the nations, mentioned in Matthew 25 verses 31 to 46. This is when all Gentiles on the earth for the final battle against God are judged based upon how they treated Israel. In other words, if they believed God, then they blessed Israel, doing whatsoever Jesus commanded in the kingdom, Matthew 28 verse 20, Isaiah 2 verses 2 to 3, and they receive eternal life in God's kingdom on earth. If they did not believe God, they cursed Israel, joining forces with Satan here, once they are no longer under Jesus' rod of iron rule, Psalm 2 verses 7 to 9. They are then sent into everlasting fire. This judgment is not mentioned here because revelation is concerned with Israel. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to shew unto his servants, Israel, things which must shortly come to pass, Revelation 1 verse 1. Having said this, it is possible that this judgment happens at the end of the tribulation period. The problem with this view is that it leaves no biblical account of a judgment for believing Gentiles at the end of the millennial reign. Also, if the judgment is at the end of the tribulation period, then why have a millennial reign since the fate of Gentiles in Israel's program has already been decided beforehand? It is for these reasons that I believe this judgment occurs here. Once the judgment of the living Gentiles occurs, the judgment of all spiritually dead people takes place. That is what is mentioned here and is called the great white throne judgment because God sits on a great white throne, Revelation 20 verse 11. This is when all dead unbelievers from all dispensations are judged into the lake of fire. Once sin is thrown into the lake of fire, it will not be around to corrupt the heaven and the earth anymore. Therefore, God creates a new heaven and a new earth, Revelation 21 verse 1, that has not been corrupted nor has been cursed with the curse of sin.
Through all of this, God's word still stands, as Jesus said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away, Matthew 24 verse 35. Revelation 20 colon 12 note that it is the dead who stand before God. This refutes Jehovah Witness teaching that the dead are not tormented in fire because they are unconscious. God says that the dead stand before God. If they can stand, they can feel pain forever in the lake of fire. The dead are those who did not take part in the first resurrection before the millennial reign, Revelation 20 verses 5 to 6, or in the rapture of the body of Christ, 1 Thessalonians 4 verses 16 to 17. Thus, this judgment is of all unbelievers from all dispensations. We know this because all believers have the abundant life of Christ, John 10 verse 10. They were dead in trespasses and sins, Ephesians 2 verse 1, but now they are quickened, together with Christ, Ephesians 2 verse 5. Therefore, the dead must be a reference to all unbelievers. The books. Being opened is a reference to the books of the Bible. They were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works, Revelation 20 verse 12. The book of life is opened, to Revelation 20 verse 12, but their names are not found in the book of life. Therefore, their works must be compared with the word of God to find out if they earned righteousness by living a holy life. If they have patient continuance in well-doing, they will receive eternal life, Romans 2 verse 7. The problem is that there is none righteous, no, not one, Romans 3 verse 10. Therefore, they all go to the lake of fire. This is why 2015 says, whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Without the gift of life, they must earn life by their works. Since everyone's works fall short, all are thrown into the lake of fire, who are judged by their works compared with the Bible. Therefore, the only way to please God is by faith. Hebrews 11 verse 6. Revelation 20 colon 13 the C, Revelation 20 verse 13, is used in the Bible to refer to Satan's realm, example, the great whore, sitteth upon many waters, Revelation 17 verse 1. Therefore, this does not just refer to those buried at sea. Rather, this is a reference to all of those who are in hell being brought to this judgment. When a believer dies today, his soul and spirit go to heaven. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 8. His flesh stays in the grave until the rapture, at which time his flesh is raised as incorruptible. In other words, this mortal puts on immortality, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 53, and our vile flesh is changed to be fashioned like unto Christ's glorious body, Philippians 3 verse 21. When an unbeliever dies, his soul and spirit go to hell. This is referred to as the sea, Revelation 20 verse 13, here, meaning a sea of fire. His flesh remains in the grave since mortal flesh would burn away in hell. Then, at this judgment, the flesh is raised up to put on immortality. This event is referred to, here, as death and hell, delivering up the dead. Hell contains all unbelievers' souls and spirits, while death contains all unbelievers' fleshly bodies. These all come together for the great white throne judgment. Unbelievers' flesh is transformed so that it will last forever in a burning lake of fire. Scripture refers to this immortal flesh in hell. As their worm, Mark 9, 44, 46, 48, which is an abhorring to all those who see it, Isaiah 66, verse 24. Therefore, believers' bodies are glorified, while unbelievers' bodies degenerate. Revelation 20 verse 13 emphasizes, as does Revelation 20 verse 12, that all those at this judgment are judged according to their works. Romans 2 verses 6 to 10 gives the details of this judgment. Those who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality receive eternal life, Romans 2 verse 7. Those who do not obey the truth receive tribulation and anguish, Romans 2 verses 8 to 9. 
In other words, if you are judged according to your works, you are thrown into the lake of fire, because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3 verse 23. This is why all those in death and hell are cast into the lake of fire. Revelation 20 verse 14. No exceptions. Revelation 20 colon 14 Since death and hell have been corrupted by sin, they, too, are thrown into the lake of fire. Implied in this is that all the dead which were in them, Revelation 20 verse 13, are thrown into the lake of fire with death and hell. Since they have their immortal bodies now, they will burn forever. Their bodies burn down to what they really are without Christ, which are worms. And, in the lake of fire, their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched, Mark 9 verses 44 and 46, 48. This eternal burning is the second death, Revelation 20 verse 14. We have already seen, from Isaiah 66 verse 24, that all those in hell are an abhorring unto all flesh. Revelation 14 verses 9 to 11 says that they are tormented with fire and brimstone and that the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. Therefore, they both look and feel horrible. For the saved, however, the second death hath no power. Revelation 20 verse 6. Death is swallowed up in victory. 1. Corinthians 15:54. Death has finally been destroyed, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 26. Glory to God! What this shows us is that life and death are conditions. What I mean is that most people look at life and death from a fleshly perspective. They see life as all those who are breathing. Therefore, a top athlete has life just like someone on life support who cannot breathe on his own. Then, they see death as like being in an unconscious state where you simply cease to exist. However, God's perspective is completely different. God says that life and death are eternal conditions within the spiritual realm. If you have life in Christ, you have abundant life, John 10 verse 10, and God will show you the exceeding riches of His grace, Ephesians 2 verse 7, toward you for all eternity. While those, in eternal death, suffer great torment for all eternity. Therefore, your choice is not between eternal bliss or eternal non-existence, but it is between eternal bliss and eternal torment. Not only that, but there are also degrees of eternal bliss and torment. For the believer, we are told that our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, 2 Corinthians 4 verse 17. Therefore, we can have even more eternal bliss when we suffer for Christ's sake in this life. For the unbeliever, we are told that those who follow religion end up being twofold more the child of hell, Matthew 23 verse 15, and so they have even more eternal torment than your typical unbeliever. Luke 12 verses 47 to 48 shows degrees of punishment in hell as well. Revelation 2015 to 2012 says that the books of the Bible were opened and the book of life was opened. The book of life contains the name of every person who has ever lived. When the dead are judged according to the law contained in the Bible, they are found lacking. Therefore, their names are blotted out of the book of life, Revelation 3 verse 5. Because their names are not written in the book of life, they receive the second, and final, death, being cast into the lake of fire. Note how this verse does not say that all people at the great white throne judgment are cast into the lake of fire. It just says that those who are not written in the book of life are cast into the lake of fire. The reason I think God words it this way is that I think that there is one person at this judgment who is not cast into the lake of fire. That person is Jesus. Since Jesus, the man, had to obey the law perfectly in order to be the substitutionary sacrifice for all of mankind who have faith in Jesus, Jesus, the man, has to be judged by his works. Because he did have patient continuance in well-doing, he receives eternal life, Romans 2 verse 7. Now, he already received his glorified body at his resurrection 2,000 years ago. Therefore, Jesus, the man has already put on immortality, 
but he should still be judged at this judgment, showing the whole world that they must have had faith in Jesus in order to be saved. Once all have been judged and only Jesus is found to receive eternal life based on his works, then, I believe, the scripture will be fulfilled that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, Philippians 2 verses 10 to 11, because only the Lord could fulfill the law perfectly. After all, if 100 billion people are judged at this judgment and every single one of them is found to be lacking, both small and great, Revelation 20 verse 12, except Jesus, everyone would have to admit finally that Jesus Christ is Lord. The evidence of 100 billion people's works would demand such to be the case. Also, they do not have their vile flesh to keep them from bowing the knee, because it was destroyed when they died, and they have not received their hellfire flesh yet. Revelation 21 With the first heaven and the first earth passed away, God creates a new heaven and a new earth, verse 1. The dispensation of the fullness of times, 10 colon 6, Ephesians 1 verse 10, begins. New Jerusalem, from which Jesus and the little flock will rule the world, is set on the new earth, verse 2. The curse of sin is lifted, verses 3 to 6, and God indwells all of saved mankind, verse 7. Christ is married to New Jerusalem, which consists of the Israel of God, Galatians 6 verse 16, verses 9, Jerusalem is finally holy, verse 10, dot, the description of which is given in verses 10, 23. This is the main passage that churchianity uses to describe heaven, but it is really talking about New Jerusalem on earth, showing that churchianity does not believe their Bible. The saved Gentiles live outside of the city, verse 24, but are able to come into New Jerusalem whenever they want, verses 25 to 26, because the gates of the city are always open so that Israel may eat the riches of the Gentiles, Isaiah 61 verse 6. Although Jesus has an open gate policy, no thing will defile, work an abomination, or make a lie there, verse 27, because Satan, his angels, and all those following him are in the lake of fire, verse 8. Therefore, life on this earth will be eternal joy. Revelation 21 colon 1 with all unbelievers and all wickedness being thrown into the lake of fire forever, God can now set up his eternal kingdom on earth. Since the earth was polluted with the slain blood of righteous men, God brings about a new heaven and a new earth. No one will remember the old earth, because there is no sorrow in God's kingdom, Isaiah 65 verse 17. The new heaven and the new earth will last forever, Isaiah 66 verse 22. Note that there was no more sea, Revelation 21 verse 1. I mentioned, in Revelation 20 verse 13, that the sea stands for Satan's domain. God created the seas on the third day of creation, Genesis 1 verse 10, as a reminder of the satanic rebellion that would take place on the earth. However, with Satan and his forces having been destroyed forever, he has no more influence whatsoever upon the earth. Therefore, God has no more sea on the new earth. Revelation 21 colon 2 with the new heaven and the new earth being in place, Israel's paradise is moved to the earth. This paradise is called the Holy City, New Jerusalem, Revelation 21 verse 2. It is as a bride adorned for her husband, Revelation 21 verse 2. Revelation 21 verses 9 to 27 gives a description of the bride, the Lamb's wife, showing that it is the New Jerusalem. Isaiah 62 verse 4 says that Christ will marry the land. God waits until all Israel is saved, Romans 11 verse 26 before he marries her, because only then is the bride adorned for her husband, Revelation 21 verse 2. Remember that Revelation 19 verse 8 says that the bride was adorned in clean, white, fine linen, which is the righteousness of saints. In Revelation 3 verse 4, Jesus said that the saints in Sardis shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. These verses tell us that Israel must believe God to give her his imputed righteousness in order to be worthy to be adorned in the white linen of righteousness. Once all Israel is saved, Romans 11 verse 26, she receives this adornment for her husband, and it is only then that Christ will marry the land of Israel. Until then, Israel is not worthy of marrying Christ. 
Today, people talk about visiting the Holy Land. However, Jerusalem is not holy today. It will not be holy until Jesus sets up God's kingdom on earth. Note also that New Jerusalem comes down out of heaven. Jesus told saved Israel in Matthew 6 verse 20 to lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Those who do not rightly divide the word of truth will try to apply Matthew 6 verse 20 to themselves today, saying that, since our home is in heaven, we need to lay up treasures there. However, Matthew is written to Israel, not to the body of Christ today. Israel's eternal dwelling place is the earth, not heaven. However, New Jerusalem is in heaven right now, since the earth is corrupt right now, due to Satan being the god of this world, 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4. Therefore, their treasures are laid up in heaven before Jesus' second coming. Then, after the millennial reign, those treasures come down to the earth when New Jerusalem is brought to the earth for them to enjoy for all eternity. Therefore, Israel is to lay up treasures for themselves in heaven to be enjoyed on the earth later, just like someone may lay up treasures in a bank to be enjoyed by them later in their home. Revelation 21,3-4 God had Moses build a tabernacle where God dwelt with Israel temporarily. Now, though, in the new Jerusalem, God dwells with man permanently. God had to take away his dwelling with Adam when Adam sinned because a holy God cannot dwell with unholy man. However, in the new Jerusalem, Israel has received the atonement and they will obey God's law such that they will always be holy, Ezekiel 36 verse 27. Since nothing but holiness is on the new earth, God can now dwell with man. Israel is now finally his people. God's dwelling with man is a huge accomplishment for God that is thousands of years in the making. God told Israel, The heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that ye build unto me? And where is the place of my rest? For all those things hath mine hand made, and all those things have been, saith the Lord. But to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word, Isaiah 66 verses 1 to 2. In other words, man cannot build a house for God to dwell in. God has to build the house himself, and that house consists of people with a poor and contrite spirit. In other words, God only uses those who have faith in his word to them to build his house, Zechariah 6 verses 12 to 13, as an habitation of God through the Spirit, Ephesians 2 verse 22, and it takes God thousands of years to find the quality of people with faith in God in order for God to build his own house. He hath made everything beautiful in his time, also, he hath set the world in their heart, so that no man can find out the work that God mocketh from the beginning to the end, Ecclesiastes 3 verse 11. With sin being completely removed, the effects of sin are also completely removed. Therefore, there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, Revelation 21 verse 4. Today, people, who blame God for bad things or think of God as evil, have a complete lack of understanding of this verse. God does not cause bad things to happen. Rather, he removes all sorrow when Satan and those following him are removed. Therefore, it is Satan, man, and sin that cause death, sorrow, crying, and pain, not God. It is an absolutely wonderful thing that the former things are passed away, Revelation 21 verse 4. This means that all the sins of the flesh and the consequences of those sins will not be present in God's kingdom. Israel will also be full of the knowledge of the Lord, Isaiah 11 verse 9, which will keep them from sorrowing over things. For example, family and friends may be in hell, but the knowledge of the Lord will keep believers from sorrowing over this. Although they love their family members, they will have the understanding that they were fully responsible for their own decisions and received the consequences of their decisions, such that the thought of them being in hell will not bother saved individuals. This thought cannot bother them because all sorrow, crying, and pain have fled away, Revelation 21 verse 4. 
The there of Revelation 21 verse 4 has in view all those who suffer for living godly, 2 Timothy 3 verse 12, especially the believing remnant of Israel, who endured unto the end of the tribulation period. Once the tribulation period is over, God takes on the motherly characteristic of wiping the tears from the eyes of his children who have been hurt by sin. Revelation 21:5-4 saved Israel. God makes all things new after the millennial reign and the casting of Satan and his forces into the lake of fire. For the saved body of Christ, all things are become new. 2 Corinthians 5:17 At the moment we are saved. Satan is still the god of this world. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4, and the world is still following his course, Ephesians 2 verse 2. However, everything becomes new for us, once we are in Christ. All things are not actually made new on earth, until the new heaven and the new earth are brought forth. The words John writes down are true and faithful, Revelation 21 verse 5. This should not surprise us, since Jesus Christ's name is called the Word of God, Revelation 19 verse 13, and he is called faithful and true, Revelation 19 verse 11. Therefore, God's Word is distinguished by it being true and faithful, while Satan's words are lies and full of unbelief regarding God doing what he said he will do, John 8 verse 44. That is why, when anyone tells you something that is contrary to God's word rightly divided, he is, consciously or not, Satan's minister, 2 Corinthians 11 verses 13 to 15. This shows that the only thing we can rely upon is the word of God, which makes it so important that we read and believe it every single day. Revelation 21 colon 6 Alpha and Omega are the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet, respectively. Therefore, this verse is saying that the Lord Jesus Christ is the beginning and the end, Revelation 21 verse 6. For all unbelievers, he is their end, as he judges them to the lake of fire. He is the beginning and the end of many things, such that he defines the beginning and the end. Ultimately, the beginning and the end refer to the time it takes God to bring about his glory plan. God is the Father of glory, Ephesians 1 verse 17. In eternity past, God designed a plan by which he would bring glory to himself and to all those who believe him. He would do this by creating and glorifying man. The first man was the Lord Jesus Christ, since Colossians 1 verse 15 says that he is the firstborn of every creature. Then, by him were all things created. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist of, Colossians 1 verses 16 to 17. This means that there is one man by which God would bring glory to himself and all believers, and this is by the man Christ Jesus, 1 Timothy 2 verse 5. Therefore, all men were made by Christ in the beginning. He made man in his own image, Genesis 1 verse 27, and he made a very good creation, Genesis 1 verse 31. However, man was made innocent, not good. Then, man chose to sin, resulting in no one being good, Matthew 19 verse 17, Romans 3 verse 12. The Lord Jesus Christ came to this earth, lived a perfect life, and died for our sins to redeem us. This was the beginning of his work in man to make us beautiful in his time, Ecclesiastes 3 verse 11. Now, he works with saved individuals to sanctify and cleanse them by the word so that they will be a glorious church, Ephesians 5 verses 26 to 27. Once this work is completed, Philippians 1 verse 6, in both Israel and the body of Christ, the end will be here. Therefore, they it, in Jesus' statement of it is done, Revelation 21 verse 6, refers to completing his work in making man the eternal vessel through which God will be glorified. Therefore, when Jesus Christ says that he is the beginning and the end, Revelation 21 verse 6, it means that he began the work of creating men who would bring glory to God forever by living in Christ, and he will end the work with man complete in Christ for God's glory. With new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven, he has now ended the work, which is why he declares here that he is the beginning and the end. This is also why he says, I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely, Revelation 21 verse 6. 
In other words, it is not too late to be part of the Father's glorification plan. Those reading these words can come to the Lord Jesus Christ to be cleansed from their sin and be part of the work that Jesus Christ completes in the end. Therefore, the Lord Jesus Christ is the beginning when he created the heaven and the earth, Genesis 1 verse 1, and he is the end when all things are gathered into Christ, when he destroys the heaven and the earth and brings about a new heaven and a new earth, Ephesians 1 verse 10, Revelation 10 verse 6. Note that there is a fountain of the water of life, Revelation 21 verse 6, coming from God's throne in such an abundant fashion that it turns into a pure river of water of life, Revelation 22 verse 1. In the kingdom, people will drink of this water and never thirst again, John 4 verse 14, because they are fully satisfied in Christ. This water ends up being the life of the Holy Ghost in believers, and the way it turns into such a large body of water is by the life of the Holy Ghost flowing from believers to God's world, John 7 verses 37 to 39. This helps explain why God created his glory plan, because God's glory abundantly flourishes in believing man, who is complete in Christ. Revelation 21:7 The way John's audience, i.e., Israel in the tribulation period, gets into the kingdom is by overcoming Satan's attack of unbelief via the Antichrist and apostate Israel. Every one of the seven churches, to whom John writes, is told that they must overcome in order to make it into the kingdom. Revelation 2:7, 2:11, 2:17, 2:26, 3:14. And 321. Therefore, near this epistle's conclusion, God gives Israel the reminder that they must overcome. If they overcome, not only will they receive eternal life in the kingdom, but they will also receive all of the blessings God has promised them in the law covenant, because Jesus Christ's perfect obedience of the law covenant is counted for them, since they had faith in God to do the works of the law for them. At that time, Israel becomes adult sons of God, Revelation 21 verse 7. Under the law covenant, they are always called the children of Israel. Under the new covenant, they are full-grown sons. We should note that, although the new heaven and the new earth do not come until after the millennial reign, Israel receives their inheritance and are adopted as God's sons at Jesus' second coming. Revelation 21 verse 3 references when God comes down from heaven and dwells with his people, but Jesus came down from heaven 1,000 years prior to this and married believing Israel. Israel then had their tears wiped away with the former things being passed away, Revelation 21 verse 4. You can think of the millennial reign as a honeymoon period for Jesus and his bride. All of this is done by the time we get to the new heaven and new earth in Revelation 21 verse 1. However, since Revelation is written to Israel in the tribulation period, Revelation 21 verses 7 to 8 serves as a reminder to Israel, before all of this, that they must overcome the Antichrist in order to be part of the Lamb's bride at his second coming. It is at that time that believing Israel receives their Adoption as sons, not when New Jerusalem comes down from heaven 1,000 years later. Revelation 21 verse 7 is a great verse to use to show the dispensational difference between the body of Christ and Israel that is present while saved people still have their vile flesh. This difference is that the body of Christ is already saved before we die, while believing Israel does not receive salvation until Jesus' second coming. God told Israel under Moses to enter the promised land with no strings attached, Exodus 6 verses 4 to 8. However, Israel would not enter in because of their unbelief, Hebrews 3 verses 17 to 19. Therefore, God put them under the Mosaic law to teach them to believe God so that they may be saved, Galatians 3 verses 23 to 25. Since the Old Covenant is not done away, Hebrews 8 verse 13, and they are not put under the New Covenant until Jesus' second coming, Jeremiah 31 verses 31 to 33, Ezekiel 36 verses 25 to 28, they continue to be under the law until then. Therefore, they must wait until Jesus' second coming before they receive their inheritance and their adoption as God's sons, Acts 3 verses 19 to 21, 1 Peter 1 verses 7 to 9. Today, in the dispensation of grace, God never put us under the Mosaic law. 
We only have the law of the conscience on our hearts. Romans 2 verses 14 to 15, 3 colon 102. Once we believe the gospel, we have learned the lesson of the conscience, such that we are not under the law, but under grace. Romans 6 verse 14. Therefore, we immediately receive the atonement, Romans 5 verses 9 to 11, and are adopted as full-grown sons, Galatians 4 verse 5. This means that the body of Christ is already seated together in heavenly places in Christ right now, Ephesians 2 verses 5 to 6, and we can operate as such today, Philippians 3 verse 20. Israel, on the other hand, must wait until Jesus' second coming to receive their inheritance, which means they are still under the Old Covenant and the Mosaic Law until then. This difference is readily seen in a simple verse comparison. Galatians 4 verses 6 to 7 says that members of the body of Christ are sons. Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. By contrast, saved Israel are called Jesus' servants, Revelation 1 verse 1, who shall be my son, Revelation 21 verse 7. Revelation 21 colon 8 and Revelation 21 verses 7 to 8, God gives Israel their two choices. They can either believe the gospel of the kingdom, be water baptized, and endure unto the end in order to receive the kingdom and inherit all things, Revelation 21 verse 7, or they can live in unbelief and burn forever in the lake of fire, Revelation 21 verse 8. The choice is theirs. The fearful. Revelation 21 verse 8. Fear them which kill the body but are not able to kill the soul. Matthew 10 verse 28. The unbelieving follow the lusts of their flesh because they do not believe what God has shown them. The abominable are those who do abominable things, which are the worst sins under the law. A lot of these are sexual in nature. Murderers kill others, including delivering people over to the Antichrist to be killed, Matthew 10 verse 21. Hormongers are the common folks who take the mark of the beast or worship the image because they follow Babylon, the great whore, Revelation 17 verse 1. Sorcerers are the religious folks who bewitch, Galatians 3 verse 1, people into following good deeds rather than believing the gospel. Idolaters are those who serve other gods, including those bowing down to the image of the beast. Liars follow the lies of Satan, making them children of the devil. John 8 verse 44. Five of the eight things listed are given again in Revelation 22 verse 15. The three not in. Revelation 22 verse 15 are the fearful, unbelieving, and abominable. Perhaps these three are summarized by the term dogs in Revelation 22 verse 15. This list, then, gives the most heinous sins, except most will say that lying does not belong because it is not as bad as the others. However, lying is the worst sin in this list because it means not abiding in the truth of God's word. Many may think they will be okay with God, yet, because they did not believe the truth, they will burn in the lake of fire forever, along with those who did the first seven things found in this list. In fact, the first seven things all stem from following Satan's lies, the eighth thing on this list. Again, the second death is mentioned so that it is clear that, when you die the first time, your life is not over. You will be resurrected to be with God for all eternity, or to burn forever in the lake of fire. All unbelievers will suffer the second death. Revelation 21 colon 9 Remember, from Revelation 21 verse 2, that the bride is New Jerusalem. Granted, all individuals part of saved Israel are part of it, but Christ marries the city itself. Therefore, when the angel shows the Lamb's wife to John, he shows him that great city, the holy Jerusalem, Revelation 21 verse 10. Revelation 21 colon 10 note that the new Jerusalem is on a great and high mountain, Revelation 21 verse 10. This is Mount Zion, as prophecy foretold. Psalm 48 verse 2 says that Mount Zion is on the sides of the north. Satan said he would exalt his throne and sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north, Isaiah 14 verse 13.
Isaiah 2 verse 2 says that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above all hills. Since the Lamb's wife is a city, it is the best and highest city on the new earth. This also tells us that the topography of the new earth is different from the earth. Today, since the highest mountain on the earth today is not in Jerusalem, since all of the new earth's inhabitants will have glorified bodies and the curse of sin will be lifted, people can climb up the mountain without any physical exertion. New Jerusalem does not need to be handicap accessible because no one will be handicapped. Thus, New Jerusalem can be on this high hill for all the world to see the glory of it and go to it from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another, Isaiah 66 verse 23. As Jesus said in Matthew 5 verse 14, a city that is set on an hill cannot be hid. Thus, New Jerusalem descends out of heaven and sits on a hill for the whole world to see Christ's beautiful bride. Since it descends out of heaven from God, Revelation 21 verse 10, the bride is God's wedding present to his son. The Lord has made saved Israel pure through the refining fire of the tribulation period. Now, God puts them in a pretty package and sends it to his son for him to enjoy for all eternity. Revelation 21 colon 11 New Jerusalem had been refined by God during the tribulation period. They are now as gold and silver, Malachi 3 verse 3. All of the impurities of sin have been melted away by the fiery furnace of the tribulation period. Therefore, her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal, Revelation 21 verse 11. In Revelation 4 verse 3, the Lord Jesus Christ is to look upon like a jasper. Therefore, the tribulation period has refined Israel so that they are holy just like Christ is, 1 Peter 1 verse 16, which makes her the perfect bride for Christ for all eternity. Since she is holy, saved Israel finally has the glory of God, Revelation 21 verse 11. Revelation 21 14 The wall is great and high to show it is a fortified city that will never be penetrated. Satan's Fortified City of Jericho fell when God destroyed it at the hands of Israel, Joshua 6 verses 20 to 21. But since God is omnipotent, the blessed and only potentate, 1 Timothy 6 verse 15, New Jerusalem will never fall. According to Ezekiel 48 verses 31 to 34, there are 12 gates because there is one for each tribe of Israel. This is confirmed here, with each gate having the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel, Revelation 21 verse 12, written on the gates. There are twelve angels there, showing that each tribe of Israel has a gate, protecting their section of the holy city. Deuteronomy 32 verse 8 says that, when God divided the earth at the Tower of Babel, He divided it into sections, according to the number of the children of Israel. Matthew 19 verse 28 says that, in the New Jerusalem, the twelve apostles will sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Therefore, the governmental structure that God set up for the new earth is that the Gentiles will be divided into twelve sections, with each section being ruled over by a tribe of Israel. Then, the twelve tribes will report back to the twelve apostles, who rule over them from Jerusalem. All Gentiles will be required to appear before God for feasts and to worship Him, Isaiah 66 verse 23, Zechariah 14 verses 16 to 19. Therefore, when they come to the new Jerusalem, they will just look for the gate with the name of the tribe of Israel over it that is over their section of the earth, and they will go through that gate to check in. When an Israelite goes to Jerusalem, he just needs to look for the name of the apostle, who is over his section, to check in. Note that these are the twelve apostles of the Lamb, Revelation 21 verse 14, which means they are the twelve that Jesus chose when he was on the earth, with the exception of Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Because the twelfth throne had to be filled, the Lord chose Matthias to replace him, Acts 1 verses 24 to 26. Note that Acts 1 verses 24 to 26 specifically says that the Lord chose Matthias. Therefore, Paul is not the twelfth apostle, as most Christians claim. 
Paul is not an apostle of the Lamb, Revelation 21 verse 14, for the prophecy dispensation. Rather, he is the apostle of the Gentiles, Romans 11 verse 13, for the mystery dispensation. These verses should also remind us of the Garden of Eden since that garden is similar to the New Jerusalem, Revelation 2 verse 7. The big difference, of course, is the lack of sin in New Jerusalem. Due to man's sin, God had to put cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep people from eating the tree of life in their sinful state. By contrast, in New Jerusalem, the tree of life is free for anyone to eat and it actually heals the nations, Revelation 22 verse 2. Revelation 21 colon 15 according to Revelation 21 verse 9, he that talked with me, Revelation 21 verse 15, is one of the seven angels who had the seven vile judgments, Revelation 21 verse 9. Revelation 21 colon 16 dash 17 the facts that the wall is 144 cubits, 216 feet tall, and the city is 12,000 furlongs, 1,500 miles high, show that man, in his glorified flesh, can fly. The city, in length and breadth, covers about two-thirds the length of the United States. A huge city today does not even close to being this massive. You also have to consider the height, which makes the city exponentially bigger. The wall makes the Great Wall of China look like a toothpick, and the city makes Los Angeles look like an art farm. The city needs to be massive because it lasts forever, and there will be no end to the increase of God's government, Isaiah 9 verse 7, which will apparently grow in eternity to 1,500 miles in length, breadth, and height. Amos 9 verse 6 says, It is he that buildeth his stories in the heaven, and hath founded his troop in the earth. How many stories can be built when a city is 1,500 miles high? The answer is, more than we can imagine. Thus, when we think about the height of the walls and of the city, we start to understand just how massive the New Jerusalem is. 12 is the number of governmental perfections. That is why everything here is 12 or evenly divisible by 12. There are 12 gates, 12 angels, 12 tribes, Revelation 21 verse 12, 12 apostles, 12 foundations, Revelation 21 verse 14, 12,000 furlongs, Revelation 21 verse 16, and 144 cubits, 12 times 12, Revelation 21 verse 17. That is seven things of 12, showing that governmental perfection, the number 12, has reached spiritual perfection, the number 7. Since numbers mean something, it is important that the original measurements, as found in the King James Version, are mentioned, because, when furlongs are converted to miles and cubits are converted to feet, the significance of the number 12 is literally lost in the translation. It is funny how today's Christians want to look to the original Hebrew and Greek languages to change the meaning of God's word, yet, when the originals are necessary, as in the case of measurements, those are abandoned for modern measurements. This shows that the true motive of modern translations is to propagate Satan's lie program rather than helping you garner truth from God's word. Also, from Revelation 21 verse 17, we learn that an angel does not have wings since he looks like a man. This comes from the angel being equated to a man. However, we also must note that angels are not men, but are a different type of God's creation. Man was made a little lower than the angels, Hebrews 2 verse 7, and will end up judging angels in God's kingdom, 1 Corinthians 6 verse 3. I have made the point of looking at the bodily form of an angel, here, since churchianity would have you believe that angels are female with wings and long hair. They are wrong on all three counts. What they think an angel looks like is actually more like what a cherub looks like. Since Satan was the anointed cherub that covereth, Ezekiel 28 verse 14, churchianity's pictures of angels are more satanic than they are angelic, which, again, propagates Satan's lie program. I think the reason that the measure of a man, Revelation 21 verse 17, is mentioned is so we know that the cubits are mankind's cubits, which are 18 inches, as opposed to sacred cubits, which are about 21 inches long. 
This also tells us that God had to come down to man's level in order to dwell with him, which is exactly what Jesus did. He lived a perfect life and died on the cross to redeem us. Note that the city Leith Foursquare, Revelation 21 verse 16, this fixes its size slash shape as a square. This is important to note because most people say it is a pyramid. They say this because the pyramid is Satan's symbol, which is why it is seen in Egypt, on United States currency, and all over Satan's secret societies, such as Freemasonry and the Illuminati. The deception of Satan is to make his things look like God's things, so that people think he is God. Bible believers are not fooled by him, for we are not ignorant of his, Satan's, devices. 2 Corinthians 2 verse 11 Revelation 21,18 New Jerusalem's wall is of jasper, which reflects a characteristic of both Christ, Revelation 4 verse 3, and his bride, Revelation 21 verse 11. The city is of pure gold to show the pure holiness and beauty of the Lamb's wife. Job 23 verse 10 says that saved Israel will come forth as gold out of the tribulation period. We see this fulfilled in New Jerusalem. Note that the pure gold of the city is like unto clear glass, Revelation 21 verse 18. Revelation 21 verse 21 says that the street of the city was pure gold, as it were transparent glass. Revelation 4 verse 6 says that before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. It makes me wonder if the sea of glass before God's throne is of pure gold. Revelation 21,19-20 Before Lucifer's fall, he was adorned with ten precious stones, Ezekiel 28 verse 13. However, because New Jerusalem represents governmental perfection, it is adorned with twelve precious stones. No doubt there is significance behind each one of these twelve stones. I am guessing that the strengths of each of the stones correlates to the strengths of each of the tribes of Israel, as mentioned in Genesis 49. Jasper equals protection, Benjamin equals devour the prey and divide to others. Sapphire equals wisdom, Gad equals overcomer. Chalcedony equals nurturing, Zebulun equals haven. Emerald equals love, Joseph equals fruitful, fruit of the spirit is love, Gal. 522. Sardonyx equals strength, Issachar equals strength. Sardius, ruby, equals passion, Levi equals cruelty in protecting Israel. Chrysolite equals cleanser, Judah equals ruler, rules with a rod of iron, P.S. 2 colon 9. Beryl, aquamarine, equals courage, Simeon equals cruelty in protecting Israel. Topaz equals soothes and stimulates, Asher equals royal dainties. Chrysoprasus equals communication, Dan equals judge. Jacinth, diamond equals purity, Naphtali equals a free deer. Amethyst equals power, Reuben equals strength and power. Revelation 21, 21 several gate just means that each gate by itself is of one pearl. So, there are 12 gates, and each gate is made of one pearl. When you consider that each gate is over 200 feet high, Revelation 21 verse 17, those are humongous pearls. When the Wizard of Oz movie says to follow the yellow brick road to the wizard's house, it must have gotten that idea from this passage, as the street of the city is made of pure gold, stretches 1,500 miles, and leads right to God and his throne. Most every Christian will tell you that the Bible says that heaven has walls of jasper, Revelation 21 verse 18, gates of pearl, Revelation 21 verse 21, and streets of gold, Revelation 21 verse 21. However, these are descriptions of New Jerusalem, not of heaven. Granted, heaven probably looks similar to New Jerusalem, which is probably why the Bible does not give a physical description of heaven. However, it is worth noting that heaven looks different than New Jerusalem, especially when you consider that we are the body of Christ and Israel is the bride of Christ. Just like a man's body is similar but different from a woman's body, heaven must be similar but different from New Jerusalem. I am sure that heaven is just as beautiful as New Jerusalem, just in a different way. 
Revelation 21 colon 22 dash 23. These are significant verses that we dare not miss. God had Israel build a temple for God to dwell in, and God put a sun in the sky to light the earth. Both the temple and the sun are just types of two of the aspects of God. God shines so brightly that the sun is no longer needed. God is so all-encompassing that there is no need for a temple because he is the temple. When Solomon built God a temple, he said, But will God in very deed dwell with men on the earth? Behold, heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain thee, how much less this. House which I have built. 2 Chronicles 6 verse 18 The Lord himself said, The heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that ye build unto me? And where is the place of my rest? Isaiah 66 verse 1 God is so big that he does not dwell in a temple. Rather, he is the temple in which saved Israel dwells. A temple is a holy place, and God is holy. Therefore, he is the perfect place for his people to dwell in. The body of Christ is an holy temple in the Lord, Ephesians 2 verse 21, in heavenly places. Therefore, it makes sense that God would be the temple forever on the earth, consisting of saved Israel dwelling in him. All people are either in Adam or in Christ, regardless of dispensation. For the mystery dispensation, saved people dwell in his body. For the prophecy dispensation, saved people dwell in his bride, which makes them part of Christ, when he marries them. He is the temple, and they dwell in him. Note that Revelation 21 verse 22 says that the Godman, the Lord Jesus Christ, is the temple. Jesus, as God, is the Lord God Almighty. Jesus, as man, is the Lamb. Together, he is the Godman, the Lord Jesus Christ, making him the temple in which saved Israel dwells. John 1 verse 9 says that Jesus is the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Today, that is true spiritually. In the new Jerusalem, it will also be true physically. Saved Israel ends up being the new moon. They are referenced in this verse as the glory of God did lighten it, Revelation 21 verse 23. So, Israel is the moon, and Jesus is the sun that light new Jerusalem. Therefore, the sun and the moon, which are just inferior types of God's light, are not needed because they have the true light, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of Righteousness, Malachi 4 verse 2. Shining in their midst with Israel being a lesser light or manifestation of God's glory. Revelation 21 colon 24 In the millennial reign, there will be some who sin, and that sin will be punished, Isaiah 65 verse 20. Then, all those who want to live by the lusts of their flesh will join Satan in his rebellion against God at the end of the millennial reign, Revelation 20 verses 7 to 9. God will destroy them and throw them into the lake of fire, Revelation 20 verses 9 to 15. Therefore, by the time we get to the new Jerusalem, all sin, rebellion, and unbelief have been done away with. The Gentiles, in God's kingdom on earth, are all saved Gentiles under the prophecy program. They received eternal life in the kingdom for blessing Israel, Matthew 25 verses 31 to 46. Therefore, Revelation 21 verse 24 says, the nations of them which are saved. Since they are all saved, they will live forever in God's eternal kingdom on earth without sinning. They will do this by walking in the light of New Jerusalem, which is the light of the Lord Jesus Christ, Revelation 21 verse 23. Just like the heavenly places have principalities, powers, might, and dominions, Ephesians 1 verse 21, the earth will have a similar governmental structure. Those with a greater understanding of the prophecy program, due to a greater faith that they have in God's word, will be appointed kings. Those kings, because of their faith in God, will properly bring the glory and honor of their nations to the Lord Jesus Christ, Revelation 21 verse 24. Revelation 21 colon 25 night is a type of Satan's realm. John 3 verses 19 to 20 says, Men loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. 
For everyone that doeth evil hadeth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. Thus, we see that night and darkness are where Satan and sin lurk. With Satan and all sin gone in God's kingdom, night and darkness cease to exist, and there is no need to close the gate to New Jerusalem since nothing bad can enter it. Sleep is a sign of spiritual inactivity, Matthew 25 verse 5. With everyone being spiritually alive in the kingdom, there is no need for sleep, which makes darkness unnecessary. Also, Genesis 1 verse 2 associates darkness with the earth being without form and void. The earth is far from this with God himself dwelling with all saved people from Israel's dispensation. Revelation 21 colon 26 both verses 24 and 26 talk about the Gentile nations bringing their glory and honor into New Jerusalem. There will be natural resources and natural talents that each Gentile nation will have, and they will bring those things into the New Jerusalem for all to enjoy. An example of this is when the Queen of Sheba brought spices to Jerusalem, 1 Kings 10 verse 10, almond trees came from Ophir, 1 Kings 10 verse 11, and cedar trees came in from Lebanon, 1 Kings 7 verse 2. In other words, God has spread resources all over the earth, and those resources will all come together in the New Jerusalem. That is what is meant by the Gentiles bringing the glory and honor of their nations into Jerusalem. Revelation 21 colon 27 When God created the heaven and the earth, God saw that it was very good, Genesis 1 verse 31. The same will happen with his creation of the new heaven and the new earth. Unlike the first time, man will not be corrupted by Satan, and the sin nature will no longer be around. Therefore, nothing that defileth, worketh abomination, or mocketh a lie, Revelation 21 verse 27, will enter New Jerusalem. That way, it remains holy for all eternity. The people entering New Jerusalem are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, Revelation 21 verse 27, meaning that they had faith in what God told them, such that they are free from sin for ever. Primarily, this would be saved Israel and saved Gentiles, all from Israel's dispensation, although I am sure that the body of Christ will be able to enter New Jerusalem as well, even if it is not their normal realm. Note how the focus of this verse is not on people, but it is upon things that would bring sin into New Jerusalem. That is because, when God made the Garden of Eden, the serpent came in and deceived Eve. He was the thing that defileth, worketh abomination, and mocketh a lie, Revelation 21 verse 27. Chapter 21 describes the paradise on earth of New Jerusalem, and this verse concludes the chapter by giving Israel the assurance that their paradise will never be ruined by things that could cause the fall of man, i.e., Satan and his forces. Revelation 22 While chapter 21 describes the Lamb's wife, New Jerusalem, in relation to Israel dwelling there, chapter 22 begins with more of a focus on the Gentiles coming to that kingdom. They come in to eat and drink of life, being healed from whatever sins they have committed, verses 1 to 2. They do not die, as Adam did, because there is no more curse of sin, verse 3, since everyone, Jew, and Gentile, in God's kingdom has made the choice to have faith in what God told them. As a result, all are holy, which means they will see God's face and live, verse 4. The purpose of the book of Revelation is given in verse 6, i.e., to shew unto God's servants the things which must shortly be done. They are then told to believe what God has shown them in Revelation, verse 7. The little flock is not to execute judgment on apostate Israel during the tribulation period, verse 11. Instead, they should let both the wheat, believing Israel, and the tares, apostate Israel, grow until the end of the tribulation period, Matthew 13 verse 30. Then, Jesus will come and execute judgment, verse 12. God gives a warning that the religious crowd will be thrown into the lake of fire, verse 15, because they add to and delete God's word, making it of none effect, verses 18 to 19. But whosoever will may have eternal life in the kingdom, verses 14 and 17, and they are the ones who cry, even so, come, Lord Jesus, 
verse 20, so that Satan's kingdom is utterly destroyed and God's kingdom lasts forever on earth, Daniel 2 verse 44. This is the ultimate goal of the prophecy dispensation. Revelation 22 colon 1 Zechariah 14 colon 8 describes this pure river of water of life as living waters. The water comes directly from God's throne, Revelation 22 verse 1. It goes out from the temple and turns into a river, Ezekiel 47 verses 1 to 5. Revelation 22 colon 2 3 in talking of this river of life, Jesus said, Whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life, John 4 verse 14. In other words, the Gentiles will continue to drink from it in order to have everlasting life. Ezekiel 47 verse 9 says, Everything that liveth, which moveth, whithersoever the river shall come, shall live. Saved Israel will be under the new covenant, in which God will write his law on their hearts, Jeremiah 31 verse 33, and cause them to obey it, Ezekiel 36 verse 27. Therefore, Israel will live in sinless perfection in New Jerusalem. This is also true of saved Gentiles who have blessed Israel, since Jesus specifically tells them, Come, ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world, Matthew 25 verse 34. So, why do people have to come to the river of life in order to live and eat of the leaves off the tree in order to be healed, when they have eternal life and no ailments? The answer is that children will continue to be born in the dispensation of the fullness of times. Isaiah 9 verse 7 says there will be no end to the increase of Jesus' government, which means that new people have to be born. Also, Ezekiel 47 verse 22 says that Gentiles will be born in the kingdom. According to Isaiah 65 verse 20, each newborn will go through a 100-year trial period. They will not have the sin nature, they will not have Satan to deceive them, and the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea, Isaiah 11 verse 9, Habakkuk 2 verse 14. Therefore, their propensity to sin is far less than what we have today, but they still have the capacity to sin. When they do sin, they can eat of the leaves of the tree of life in order to be healed. Note that Revelation 21 verse 27 says that anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination, or mocketh a lie can enter new Jerusalem. This means that, among the newborns, the only ones allowed to enter new Jerusalem are those who regret sinning. If they sinned and planned to do it again, they will not be allowed to enter the city, because they could defile it. After their 100-year trial period is over, they choose life or death and enter that state for all eternity. This is in contrast to Adam and Eve. They had the tempter there, and once they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they were under the curse, having the sin nature within them. Therefore, God removed the tree of life from them so that they would not live forever in their fallen state, Genesis 3 verse 22. In the New Jerusalem, however, there shall be no more curse, Revelation 22 verse 3. Therefore, the Gentiles are healed from the leaves of the tree of life and can live forever in the kingdom if they choose life after their 100-year trial period is over. Adam failed to keep the garden free from sin as he allowed Eve to eat of the forbidden grapes. By contrast, the second Adam will be in New Jerusalem, and he will faithfully keep paradise from having sin enter it, Revelation 21 verse 27. Eve, of course, failed to obey God, but the second Adam's wife, saved Israel, will not fail, as they will submit themselves to their husband and serve him, as they are commanded to, Ephesians 5 verse 22. This is what Revelation 3 verse 4 means when it says, They shall walk with me in white for they are worthy. In other words, the faithfulness of the little flock to believe the gospel of the kingdom will translate into their faithful obedience of their husband, the Lord Jesus Christ, such that they will not defile paradise. Without believing the gospel, they would not be worthy to be the lamb's wife. Thus, in Adam and Eve, we see failure by both parties, resulting in a fallen world and humanity, but in Jesus Christ and saved Israel, we see both parties doing what they should, 
resulting in a perfect, holy world and humanity. Nevertheless, even in the dispensation of the fullness of times, some Gentile children, under 100 years old, will choose to rebel against God, and these will be cast into the lake of fire. This choice may seem unlikely without Satan to tempt man, with full knowledge of the Lord available, with the sin nature not being present, and with being able to see people burning in hell, Isaiah 66 verse 24, but man's will is strong. The throne of God and of the Lamb is a phrase found only in Revelation 22 verses 1 and 3. It does not say thrones, but throne. To me, this means that the Lord Jesus Christ as God and as the Lamb, man, is sitting on the throne in God's kingdom on earth. It shows that the way that God dwells with his people, Revelation 21 verse 3, is through the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, God's plan was to make man, man would fall, God would send God the Son to earth. As a man, he would succeed, God would indwell him since he is perfect, then God would set the Godman on the throne in his kingdom, place believers into Christ, and indwell all believers because they are all in Christ and God is in Christ. God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 19. Revelation 22 colon 4 Matthew 5 colon 8 says that the pure in heart shall see God. Thus, faithful Israel sees God's face in the kingdom. In Revelation 7, God sealed the 144,000 by having his name written on their foreheads, Revelation 14 verse 1. Satan copied this by having his mark on people's foreheads, Revelation 13 verse 16. Now, we see that all of saved Israel, not just the 144,000, have God's name on their foreheads. This name may be holiness to the Lord, Exodus 28 verses 36 to 38, since that is the name that was to be on a gold plate on the forehead of the high priest, and Israel is to be a kingdom of priests to the Gentiles, Exodus 19 verses 5 to 6. Regardless of what it is, Revelation shows that all people belong to someone, either to God or to Satan. This flies in the face of New Age thinking that I am my own God. Revelation 22 colon 5 as we saw in Revelation 21 verse 23, night and the sun are not needed in New Jerusalem. The Lord God is the true light, John 1 verse 9. Therefore, the Lord God giveth them light in the New Jerusalem, Revelation 22 verse 5. Saved Israel's reign over the Gentiles on earth lasts forever and ever, Revelation 22 verse 5, because God's kingdom will last forever, Daniel 2 verse 44. Contrast this with the beast, who reigned for only three twelve years, Revelation 13 verse 5. These facts should encourage Israel to endure unto the end of the tribulation period in order to rule forever, Matthew 10 verse 22. As Paul says, our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, 2 Corinthians 4 verse 17. Although this promise is for the body of Christ, the principle also applies to saved Israel and Israel's program, since they shall reign forever and ever, Revelation 22 verse 5. Revelation 22 colon 6 His angel is the one referred to in Revelation 1 verse 1, who showed John all of the things written in Revelation, so that he may, in turn, show them to Israel, so that they may endure unto the end of the tribulation period and enter God's eternal kingdom on earth. The Lord God calls himself the Lord God of the holy prophets, Revelation 22 verse 6, here, to signify that this message is for the prophecy dispensation. 
The information in Israel's program is what God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began, Acts 3 verse 21. By contrast, the information for us today is the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest, Romans 16 verses 25 to 26. Therefore, the information found in Revelation does not apply to us today in the dispensation of grace. Rather, it is part of Israel's prophecy program. We are told that these events must shortly be done, Revelation 22 verse 6. This is in terms of the prophecy program's timeline, as 2,000 years have passed since these words were written, and they have not been fulfilled yet. Daniel 9 verse 24 says, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. These are 70 weeks of years, or 490 years total. After the Messiah is crucified, the Antichrist comes and does some things, and then there is the seven-year tribulation period, Daniel 9 verses 26 to 27. In terms of this timeline, at the time the book of Revelation is written, only the events of the Antichrist in Daniel 9 verse 26 remain before the tribulation period events detailed in Revelation come to pass. Therefore, in terms of this timeline, the things mentioned in Revelation must shortly be done, Revelation 22 verse 6. Also, remember that we mentioned in the notes on Revelation 1 verse 3 that Revelation was written during the at hand phase of the kingdom, which means that it was written before the mystery was revealed to Paul in Acts 9. Therefore, the 2000 year or more interlude of the mystery was not yet revealed, which is why Revelation can only be spoken in terms of the Daniel timeline. As such, these events must shortly be done. Finally, note that the sayings in Revelation are faithful and true, Revelation 22 verse 6. Revelation 19 verse 11 says that Jesus is faithful and true. Revelation 19 verse 13 says that his name is called the Word of God. Therefore, by declaring that the sayings in Revelation are faithful and true, the angel is saying that what has been revealed to John is the Word of God without error. Therefore, Israel can hold fast to its truth so that they are not tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine, Ephesians 4 verse 14, during the greatest time of deception this world will ever see, Matthew 24 verses 21 to 24. Revelation 22 colon 7 Jesus Christ's second coming occurs at the end of the tribulation period. Note from Revelation 22 colon 7, 12, 20 and 3 11 that Jesus Christ says, I come quickly. He does not say, I come soon, as most Christians believe he says here. The difference is that he is not saying that it will not be long until he comes, although that is true in terms of the timeline in Daniel. Rather, he says that, when he does come, he will come quickly, meaning that he will come fast. You can think of this like a right fielder in baseball. The fielder may stand out there for 15 minutes and not move, but when a ball comes his way, he acts quickly to get it. So, too, Jesus Christ has not come back nearly 2,000 years after this promise was made, but, when it is time, he will come back quickly. I come quickly is a warning to Israel that they had better have faith in God's law covenant and be serving him before his coming, because, when they hear of his coming, they will not have time to get ready, because his coming is quick. This is clearly explained to Israel in the parable of the ten virgins in Matthew 25 verses 1 to 13. Five of the virgins do not make it into the kingdom because they did not have time to prepare themselves for the bridegroom because they waited until he was about to come before they tried to get themselves ready. Therefore, Israel, in the tribulation period, needs to keep the sayings of the prophecy of this book in order to be blessed by being part of God's eternal kingdom on earth, Revelation 22 verse 7. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Matthew 25 verse 13. Therefore, the blessing, pronounced in both Revelation 1 verse 3 and 22 colon 7, is for Israel going through the tribulation period. By keeping what is written in Revelation, they endure unto the end of the tribulation period and enter the kingdom. They then receive the blessings of the kingdom, as pronounced in Matthew 5 verses 3 to 12. 
Since these blessings are already detailed in Matthew 5, Revelation 22 verse 7 does not go into detail about them. It merely mentions a blessing for those who keep the sayings of the prophecy of this book, Revelation 22 verse 7, as a reminder to Israel to endure unto the end of the tribulation period in order to enter the kingdom, because there will not be time to repent when Jesus returns, since he comes quickly. Revelation 22 8 Under the law, a matter is established as fact in the mouth of two or three witnesses, Matthew 18 verse 16. Therefore, we are told that revelation was given by God to Jesus Christ, Revelation 1 verse 1, and John saw these things and heard them. Revelation 22 verse 8. Establishing revelation as fact by the witness of Jesus Christ, the angel, and John. Revelation 22 9 The fact that the angel tells John not to worship him, tells us that the angel is not the Lord Jesus Christ, because Jesus never refused worship of himself, since at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, Philippians 2 verse 10. When the angel says that he is of thy brethren the prophets, Revelation 22 verse 9, he does not mean that he was Isaiah, Jeremiah, or one of the other prophets, and God transformed him into being an angel. That cannot be the case because men remain men. They do not become angels in the afterlife. Rather, the angels being thy fellow servant of the prophets and of them which keep the sayings of this book links him in three ways with the nation of Israel. In other words, this angel is a servant of the believers in Israel's program. This makes sense in light of Hebrews 1 verse 14 saying that angels are ministering spirits for believers. This is yet another clue that Revelation is written to believing Israel, and not to us today. Since Michael standeth for the children of thy people, Daniel 12 verse 1, this angel is probably Michael. Revelation 22 colon 10 When Daniel was given prophecies of end time events, Israel had 490 years left in their prophetic history until God would bring in the kingdom. Since the end time events were so far into the future, God told Daniel to seal the book, even to the time of the end when knowledge shall be increased, Daniel 12 verse 4. When John receives the information found in the book of Revelation the time of the tribulation events is at hand, Revelation 22 verse 10 and 1 colon 3. Therefore, knowledge is increased with the writing of this book. This means that Revelation must have been written during the at-hand phase of the kingdom which means it had to have been written, timeways, before the stoning of Stephen in Acts 7. This flies in the face of almost every commentary ever written, which usually say that Revelation was the last book of the Bible written. However, to take the majority view, in this case, would be to deny the truth of the tribulation being at hand, as stated in Revelation 22 verse 10 and 1 colon 3. Of course, if you have gotten this far into these notes, you know that the majority view is rarely taken by this author. Revelation 22 colon 11 12 and Revelation 22 verse 12, we, again, are told that the Lord Jesus Christ is coming quickly. We learned, from Revelation 22 verse 7, that this is a warning to Israel to believe the gospel of the kingdom, because it will be too late to repent once Jesus comes back. What Revelation 22 verses 11 to 12 are saying, then, is that, since Jesus is coming, he will judge Israel. It is not John's job, or anyone else's job in Israel to judge Israel. Therefore, when it comes to judgment, Israel is to let the unjust be unjust, the filthy be filthy, the righteous be righteous, and the holy be holy, Revelation 22 verse 11. Jesus will come and reward Israel, according to their work. This is like what Jesus said in Matthew 7 verses 3 to 5. He said, rather than judging others, they should judge themselves, which would result in recognizing their sin and believing the gospel. It is only then that they will have the ability to judge others correctly. Similarly, in Revelation 22 verse 11, God says not to worry about other spiritual condition. Look at your own spiritual condition. But they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. 2 Corinthians 10 verse 12. 
Revelation 22 verse 11 is not saying that the little flock should not reach Israel with the gospel of the kingdom. In fact, their work is to preach the gospel to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, Matthew 10 verses 6 to 8. If they do not do this, their reward in the kingdom will not be as great. Therefore, the hands-off approach of Revelation 22 verse 11 relates only to judgment, not to evangelizing. Note the four categories of people in Israel during the tribulation period, as identified in Revelation 22 verse 11. The unjust are the unsaved people doing evil. In the parable of the sower, these are the people of the wayside ground, Matthew 13 verse 19. The filthy are the unsaved people doing good, since religious Israel's righteousness is as filthy rags, Isaiah 64 verse 6. In the parable of the sower, these are the people of the stony ground, Matthew 13 verses 20 to 21. The righteous are saved Israel not working for the Lord. In the parable of the sower, these are the people of the thorny ground, Matthew 13 verse 22. The holy are saved Israel, fulfilling their commission to go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel with the gospel of the kingdom. In the parable of the sower, these are the people of the good ground, Matthew 13 verse 23. The reward that Jesus Christ brings with him, Revelation 22 verse 12, is in reference to the position each member of the little flock will receive in the kingdom as a result of their work during the tribulation period. Thus, their reward is linked to their work, just like, today, our work is linked to our reward in heavenly places in the body of Christ, see 1 Corinthians 3 verses 11 to 15. Also, note that the little flock's reward is given, according as his work shall be, Revelation 22 verse 12. Each member of the little flock is refined by the fire of the tribulation period. If their work, at the end, ends up being wood, hay, or stubble, they will lose their reward. However, if they have some gold, silver, or precious stones, they will rule and reign with Christ as priests, Revelation 20 verse 6. This trang of their work by fire is mentioned in 1 Corinthians 3 verses 12 to 15. Although the Corinthian passage refers specifically to the rewards for the body of Christ and heavenly places, there will be a similar judgment of works for reward for the little flock of Israel in God's eternal kingdom on earth. But, first, their work must be refined by the fire of the tribulation period in order to determine what sort of their work shall be, Revelation 22 verse 12, in the end. Revelation 22 colon 13 The little flock of Israel can trust in the words found in the book of Revelation and continue to have faith in them, knowing that God will deliver them from the Antichrist's kingdom because the Lord Jesus Christ is the end, Revelation 22 verse 13. He was there in the beginning and created the world. Therefore, they can trust in him to bring the end to Satan's takeover of the world and bring in a new earth for his saints in Israel to dwell in, Revelation 21 verse 1. Thus, the Lord Jesus Christ is the beginning and the end of this world, Revelation 22 verse 13. He is also the first and the last, Revelation 22 verse 13. He is the firstborn of every creature, Colossians 1 verse 15, meaning that there is life only for those who are placed in Christ through faith in what God has told them, since Christ is the first fruits of the resurrection, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 23. He is also the last Adam, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 45, since he was the last man born without a sin nature. Therefore, as God, Jesus began the world, John 1 verses 1 to 3, and will end the world, Revelation 20 verse 11. As man, Jesus is the first to be raised in a glorified body to everlasting life, and he is the last man born, able to save all those with faith in what God has told them, due to his lack of a sin nature, his life lived free from sin, and his propitiatory death on the cross. Because of this, Christ is all things to all men, which is why Israel should place their faith in him in the tribulation period, rather than having faith in the Antichrist and his kingdom. Revelation 22 14 This is one of the verses that conditional salvation advocates like to throw in your face to say that you must work in order to maintain your salvation. 
Even putting aside that this verse is written to Israel and not to us today, it is still not saying that Israel must work in order to maintain their salvation, because Israel would have the same problem that we have, i.e., they could not do it. Man, sins just by thinking about committing adultery, Matthew 5 verse 28, or by hating someone in his heart, Matthew 5 verse 22. Further, if he breaks the law in just one point, he is guilty of breaking the entire law, James 2 verse 10. Therefore, even after believing the gospel of the kingdom and being water baptized, it is impossible for Israel to refrain from sinning until they are placed under the new covenant in the kingdom. As such, doing his commandments, Revelation 22 verse 14, cannot possibly mean obeying the Mosaic law. The meaning of doing his commandments is found in Romans 10 verse 16, which says, But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? This shows that you obey the gospel by believing, not by doing works under the law. During the at-hand phase of the kingdom, God commands Israel to repent ye, and believe the gospel, Mark 1 verse 15. Therefore, doing his commandments simply means to believe the gospel. When they do this, God gives them the right to the tree of life, Revelation 22 verse 14, because they will live forever in a glorified body. Contrast this with Adam and Eve, who failed to abide in God because they disobeyed his commandments. Therefore, they lost. Their clothing of light as God has, Psalm 104 verse 2, subjecting them to the curse of sin. Living forever in a fallen state is torture, therefore, God removed the tree of life from them, Genesis 3 22 23. Therefore, in Revelation, we see paradise restored, and it is only for glorified man to enjoy, since he alone can live forever without the curse of sin, being holy like God, due to his faith in God's provision to bring him up to his level. This gives them right to the tree of life. And, because glorified man is holy, he can be in the presence of a holy God. Therefore, he may enter in through the gates into the city, Revelation 22 verse 14. However, having said that, this verse is really geared more toward the Gentiles in the kingdom, who are not under the new covenant yet, as opposed to saved Jews in the kingdom. Up to age 100, these Gentiles make the free will decision to do the commandments of God, Isaiah 65 verse 20. When they sin, they have the right to enter into the gates of New Jerusalem and partake of the tree of life for their healing, Revelation 22 verse 2, so that they may live forever. Therefore, in Revelation 22 verse 14, we see the blessing of Gentiles in the kingdom to enter New Jerusalem and live forever, as a result of believing the gospel presented unto them for 100 years, while, in Revelation 22 colon 7 and 12, we see saved Jews blessed with positions in the kingdom for obeying God's instructions to them found in Revelation. Revelation 22 colon 15 without is a reference to not being able to live within God's kingdom. Therefore, those without are the unsaved in the lake of fire. They are judged by their works, Revelation 20 verse 13, and are found to be wicked because they did not have faith in what God told them. The list of people in the lake of fire begins and ends with the religious crowd. Israel called Gentiles dogs because they were not part of God's nation, Israel, Matthew 15 verses 26 to 27. The problem is that Israel forsook God's law covenant with them and replaced it with their own traditions, Mark 7 verse 9. The result is that the true dogs are unbelievers. As such, Paul calls the Jewish religious people dogs in Philippians 3 verse 2. Thus, the dogs of Revelation 22 verse 15 refers to apostate Israel, who chose to align themselves with the Antichrist, rather than believing God's law covenant with them. Also included would be all believers in religion to save them, rather than believers in God to save them. Then, the religious leaders are those whosoever loveth and mocketh a lie, Revelation 22 verse 15. Jesus told the Jewish religious leaders that ye are of your father the devil, because he is a liar, and the father of it, John 8 verse 44. Thus, those who love and make a lie, 
are Satan's leaders masquerading as God's leaders by using scripture that they twist for their own justification, 2 Corinthians 11 verses 13 to 15. The sorcerers of Revelation 22 verse 15 are those who take scripture out of its dispensational context to cast a spell on their listeners, making them think they are obeying God when they are not. This is the bewitching that Paul mentions in Galatians 3 verse 1 that people were doing by trying to put grace believers in Galatia under the Mosaic law. No doubt, Paul's epistles will be very popular during the tribulation period, as Matthew, John are popular today. We see this from Peter's comment that his epistle is the true grace of God wherein ye stand, 1 Peter 5 verse 12. In other words, doctrine from today's grace dispensation will be taught during the at-hand phase of the kingdom when the true grace that God is giving them is found in Israel's epistles of Hebrews, Revelation, not Paul's epistles. Thus, people will be under the spell of Pauline doctrine when they should be following the doctrine found in the part of the Bible written to Israel. The Hormingers are the religious crowd again, who have committed adultery with Babylon rather than believing the gospel of the kingdom. The murderers are those who convince Jews to abandon faith in God and believe the Babylonian religious system of the Antichrist and apostate Israel. The idolaters are those who worship the image of the beast. Granted, the sorcerers, hormingers, murderers, idolaters, and liars of Revelation 22 verse 15 can refer to the flesh as well, but the primary reason they are in the lake of fire is because they have manifested these characteristics in their spiritual lives. There is nothing from without a man that entering into him can defile him, but the things which come out of him, those are they that defile the man. Mark 7 verse 15 Thus, every member of apostate Israel will exhibit these things spiritually, and those, with the ears to hear, Revelation 2 verse 7, will recognize this, such that they will believe the gospel of the kingdom and refuse to believe the lies of Satan to try to get them to follow apostate Israel into the lake of fire. Finally, we should note that Revelation 22 verse 15 lists six categories of people, and six is the number of a man. We should also note a similar list in Revelation 21 verse 8. By comparing verse with verse, this proves that those who are without, in Revelation 22 verse 15, do wind up in the lake of fire, Revelation 21 verse 8. Revelation 22 colon 16 Revelation 1 verse 1 told us that Jesus Christ sent the revelation to John via his angel. This is mentioned again at the end of the book. The churches. Then, to whom revelation is sent, would be the seven churches mentioned in chapters 2 to 3. Revelation is not written to Christian churches today, because we are in the mystery dispensation, not the prophecy dispensation. Identifying Jesus as the root of David, Revelation 22 verse 16, shows that he is the branch, prophesied in the Old Testament, who would be Israel's king, Jeremiah 23 verse 5, perfect servant, Zechariah 3 verse 8, perfect man, Zechariah 6 verse 12, and God, Isaiah 40 verse 9, to deliver them from being Satan's lawful captive, Isaiah 49 verses 24 to 25, so that they may rule over the Gentiles in God's eternal kingdom on earth. Identifying Jesus as the offspring of David shows that Jesus is the one who will sit on David's throne and rule over the world forever, as God promised in 2 Samuel 7 verses 12 to 16. Regarding Jesus being the bright and morning star, Revelation 22 verse 16, Israel will dwell in God's light forever because Jesus is the day star, 2 Peter 1 verse 19. The day or morning star is the sun. Revelation 21 verse 23 says that New Jerusalem does not need the sun because the Lamb is the light thereof. The nations shall walk in the light of it, Revelation 21 verse 24. Therefore, the sun is not needed because the true light, John 1 verse 9, the Lord Jesus Christ, will be shining as the bright and morning star, Revelation 22 verse 16, in the New Jerusalem. The morning star is not to be confused with the sun of the morning, which was Lucifer's title, Isaiah 14 verse 12. The NIV, non-inspired version, changes Lucifer's title to morning star. 
the NKJV footnotes that Lucifer is the day star. Therefore, modern translations have made Lucifer equivalent to the Lord Jesus Christ. Son of the morning means that Lucifer was created to oversee that it is always morning. His problem is that he rebelled against God, becoming Satan, such that he brought about the night. The Lord Jesus Christ, by being the morning star, is the morning. Night will never appear again, because the morning star, the Lord Jesus Christ, shines brightly in God's kingdom forevermore. Revelation 22 17 here is the invitation for all to be part of God's kingdom. His kingdom is light, because of the bright and morning star, Revelation 22 verse 16, being there. This is in contrast to the world in the tribulation period, which is ruled by Satan, the prince of darkness. Whosoever will, Revelation 22 verse 16, may come out of the darkness into light. The Holy Ghost indwells the little flock during the tribulation period, and so he invites all to come into the kingdom. The bride, out there in eternity future, looks back into the tribulation period and invites all of Israel to join the bride to be married forever to the Lamb. The phrases the bride say, come and whosoever will or all the theology that is needed to understand that the Calvinists' view on predestination is incorrect. The bride, as a group, is predestinated to marry Christ, and every individual in Israel's program makes the free will decision to decide whether they will be part of that group or not. A couple of verses that are good to understand predestination are 1 Peter 1 verse 2 and Acts 2 verse 23. 1 Peter 1 verse 2 says that Israel is elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. God elected Israel to be saved, based on his foreknowledge that Israel would make the free will decision to believe the gospel. Acts 2 verse 23 says, Him, Jesus, being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. God, in his sovereignty, determined that Jesus must die for the sins of the world, and he used his foreknowledge of the free will decisions of Israel to have him crucified and slain, to have him live where and when he did. Thus, God's sovereignty and man's free will decisions go hand in hand. Therefore, when the Spirit and the Bride say, Come, Revelation 22 verse 17, they are giving God's sovereign invitation for all to believe the gospel and be saved, but it is only whosoever will, Revelation 22 verse 17, that will make the free will decision to be saved. In fact, we see both the group of believing Israel and the individual within believing Israel giving the invitation to come and receive eternal life. The group is the bride, and the individual is him that heareth, Revelation 22 verse 17. Him that heareth, Revelation 22 verse 17 is the person with the spiritual ears to hear that there is life through Jesus' name, John 20 verse 31. Him that is a thirst, is the one who realizes he is spiritually parched with the religion of apostate Israel, Jeremiah 2 verse 13. He realizes that the water that the Lord gives him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life, John 4 verse 14. Therefore, he abandons religion and his economic goods, and he believes that God will give him his imputed righteousness by changing his mind about his own righteousness, repenting, and being water baptized to identify himself with the believing remnant of Israel, who will be saved, Acts 2 verse 38. He has faith that God will bring him into the kingdom so that he can drink from God's pure river of water of life, Revelation 22 verse 1. We should note that whosoever will also extends to the Gentiles, as they have the opportunity, at the end of the millennial reign, to side with the Lord Jesus Christ and be in his eternal kingdom on earth. In the tribulation period, it is the Spirit and the Bride, speaking specifically to Israel, for them to believe God's law covenant with them and enter the kingdom as kings and priests of God, Revelation 1 colon 6, 5 10. In the millennial reign, the invitation is extended to the Gentiles, whosoever will, to side with the Lord Jesus Christ, when Satan is loosed for a little season, as only the Lord can give them free access to the water of life. Whosoever will, 
be saved can also be saved today in the dispensation of grace. However, this is true because God said so through Paul and not here through John, which is a different program than what is going on today. Revelation 22, 18 In the first three twelve years of the tribulation period, all Jews who come to Jerusalem will have heard the prophecy of this book because the two witnesses will prophesy during that time, Revelation 11, verse 3. It is then up to the Jews to have the spiritual ears to hear the Spirit and the Bride say come. If they do, they will repent about following the Antichrist and have faith in God to bring them into the kingdom, joining the believing remnant by being water baptized. If they make this choice, they will keep the sayings of the prophecy of this book, Revelation 22 verse 7. If they do not make this choice, they will be adding to the prophecies of this book by saying that they can make it into the kingdom by their own religion. The Jewish religious leaders of Jesus' day had added all kinds of rules to God's law. That way, they could get the focus onto the rules that they made up, so that they could get the focus off of God's message of good news that he had given to Israel. The result was that they were okay in murdering their Messiah because they were not defiled because they did not go into Pilate's judgment hall, John 18 verse 28. Similarly, Eve added, neither shall ye touch it, Genesis 3 verse 3, to God's law. When she broke her law and she still had her clothing of light, she was then okay with breaking God's law. This is what will happen with apostate Israel in the tribulation period. They will take the words of prophecy spoken by the two witnesses and mix in a little religion by adding works of the flesh to get people to focus on those rules rather than the truth of God's word. This is what happens today with churches saying that you must make Jesus the Lord of your life and turn from your sins in order to be saved. The result will be that they make the word of God of none effect through their tradition, Mark 7 verse 13. For adding works to God's word, God will add unto them the plagues that are written in this book, Revelation 22 verse 18, because they did not have faith to please God, Hebrews 11 verse 6. Revelation 22 colon 19 Eve also took away from the word of God. God's punishment for eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was thou shalt surely die, Genesis 2 verse 17. Eve changed this to lest ye die, Genesis 3 verse 3. In other words, God said you will die, and Eve said, I might die. Similarly, the Jewish religious leaders of Jesus' day took the law of Moses, where it said, let him die the death and changed it to he shall be free, Mark 7, 10, 11. As a result, they reject the commandment of God that they may keep their own tradition, Mark 7, verse 9. Revelation 22 colon 20 as we saw in Revelation 2 colon 5, 3 11, 22 colon 7, and 22 12, once it is time for Jesus' second coming, he will come quickly and execute the promised judgment of Revelation 22 verses 7 and 18 and 19. Therefore, it is of an eternal importance for Israel to believe and follow the things written in Revelation. Revelation 1 verse 2 identifies the book of Revelation as the testimony of Jesus Christ. Therefore, he which testifieth these things, Revelation 22 verse 20, is the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ says, Surely I come quickly, Revelation 22 verse 20. Then, it is the response of the angel, John, and the little flock to say, Amen. Even so, Come, Lord Jesus, Revelation 22 verse 20. In other words, they want him to come in the quick manner in which he has promised, so that Satan's kingdom will be overthrown and God's kingdom will be established forever. Regarding this quickness, we should note Matthew 24 verse 43, which says, But know this, that if the goodman of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. In the context of Jesus' second coming, the goodman of the house is Satan, while Jesus is the thief in the night, 2 Peter 3 verse 10. What this means is that, when it comes to his second coming, Jesus is looking for the perfect time to come. If he comes too early, not all of the lost sheep of the house of Israel will be saved, Romans 11 verse 26. If he comes too late, 
the lost sheep will become apostate and not be saved, Matthew 24 verse 22. Therefore, Jesus must come at the precise moment when, spiritually speaking, Satan, in his cockiness, is not watching for him to come. Thus, Jesus must come quickly. Revelation 22 21 Although Revelation is not part of today's grace dispensation, it is still by God's grace that Israel makes it through the tribulation period. Noah in the ark is a type of the little flock making it through the tribulation period. Genesis 6 verse 8 says that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So, too, the little flock will have the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ with them so that they endure unto the end of the tribulation period so that they are saved, Matthew 24 verse 13. They have the Holy Ghost with them, giving them God's word, and they also have the instructions to the seven churches found in chapters 2 to 3. They also have God's grace in that those days of great tribulation shall be shortened, Matthew 24 verse 22. Today, God gives us his grace to bear temptation, 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13. So, too, God will give his grace to the little flock so that they will not be devoured by the roaring lion, the devil, 1 Peter 5 verse 8, during the tribulation period, but will continue to believe that God will save them in spite of all of the things going on in the world to the contrary. Yeah.